up of the Ashes Common Council, and we'll be discussing uh, City Hall and Parks facilities, uh, some potential renovations to these uh, aging facilities. So with that, I will turn it off to, over to City Manager Roloff, who will get the ball rolling. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we're going to have two one-hour presentations slash Q&A sessions. Uh, the first one is going to be with bold construction regarding uh, the parks and forestry building. There was a study that was actually done in 2017 uh, that was then followed up with an additional study uh, to take a look at the two basic options for that. Uh, and then we'll get into the uh, FGM study on City Hall. With that, you know, Mr. Urban's been working with both departments uh, uh, on the various uh, studies that are going on. So John will take it over. Thanks, Mark. Um, so as City Manager Roloff said, just to back up a little bit to provide a little background since it's been a, a little bit of time on this, um, Bull was engaged in 2017 to conduct a facility assessment for City Hall, the Grand Opera House, and the Parks Forestry Building. You may recall that um, that had an overall appraisal score for each of the buildings. Uh, I looked at a variety of building systems at each building and then came up with a score of 0 to 100, uh, 100 being in excellent condition. And if you recall from that study, the Parks building scored the lowest with a 44 score. There were several areas of concern in that building, uh, much of which still continues today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. City Hall had a score of 70 and uh, the Grand Opera House had a 71. So as a result of that assessment, that led us into um, looking at, for one thing, we had to correct some HVAC improvements right away at the building. I don't know if you remember doing that, but mm -hmm. we went, at, went right away in 2018 and, and uh, cleaned up some HVAC issues at the Parks Building. And then we engaged uh, Bolt to do a, a cost-benefit analysis for replacement options uh, for that building. And that's where we got Bolt involved. And I'm going to turn it over to Ray now because Ray can explain the cost benefit analysis that we worked out with uh, Ray and, I mean, sorry, with Bolt and some of the, um, the various criteria that was looked at in those replacement options in that methodology. Thanks, John. Um, as, we, as we took a look at this building and um, talked a little bit about the, not too far in the history, but when I started in January 2010, um, if you recall, prior to that, the administrative offices for the Parks Department were here at City Hall. Um, when the previous Parks Director um, retired, City Manager Roloff made the decision to move the administration and the director down to um, the Witzel site to be closer to the operations, and, and I think it was a good idea. Um, but again, it was temporary at that time, and that was in 2009 and 10, and we are now in 2019. So um, that temporary move has been a little bit longer than maybe anticipated. Um, but that's, again, why we're here tonight to, to talk about some of the um, ideas that uh, might come up for that for that building. As part of the analysis that was completed by Bolt, um, I assisted with identifying factors and criteria to consider in the process. Um, and you'll get it, we'll get into those in the um, presentation by Taylor. Uh, but just to real quickly go through those for you, the first, um, and these are in no particular order, um, first item, centralize our office um, our office operations and our uh, department operations. Many of you know we have staff distributed throughout the city. Um, I have some staff that report to Menominee Park, some to the parks building, some to the cemetery, to, and some to the senior center. Um, so we really need to get our department and our staff centralized for efficiency. Uh, the next item is called fleet functionality. And what that means is the need for adequate service bays and vehicle storage spaces for our um, um, equipment. We currently don't have enough space and we are um, currently storing some equipment outside in the elements. Uh, the next item, image to community. As many of you are aware, in the neighboring uh, the neighborhood, there's a number of improvements that have been made to a number of buildings, including uh, Verve Credit Union, Fox Valley Tech, um, and some of those, and UW Oshkosh, and a few other facilities. And being a good neighbor, we really thought we needed to make sure and take that into consideration as we look at as this facility. Uh, next couple are kind of self-explanatory, energy consumption, uh, longevity. Um, another factor that we looked at was clear height of buildings and doors. Essentially, can we get all of our equipment in the existing doors? Um, we do have aerial lift trucks for our forestry operations. Um, the existing aerial truck just barely fits in to the building, and we are currently purchasing a new one through the CIP. And that one, I talked to Bill Sturm today, it is right at the limit of possibly getting into the building. If it doesn't fit into our building, we'll need to make arrangements with um, streets and engine or DPW to possibly store the um, truck over at their facility. 
Next item is shop functionality. Um, we do have a number of different trades that we um, have in our department, so we need to accommodate things such as woodworking, welding, um, and other just uh, small repair services. And then the final one is service to the public, um, not only vehicle access to our building, but also having a welcoming um, and a functional office space for doing business transactions. So as we looked at the various options, um, one option that was um, considered and we did when the field operations facility was constructed, we looked again at the field operations facility. Um, both did visit the site, talked with um, staff over there, mm -hmm. and it was essentially determined that the, the field operations facility is not viable um, due to the lack of current and future space to house the streets, sanitation, and central garage operations. Um, so that left us really with two options at our existing facility. Um, demolition of the existing building completely and rebuilding new and then uh, we're calling that one a in the report and then B um, demolish um, what we're calling down to the bones or to the structure um, as, as Taylor and then Doug can attest to um, the I-beam certain things are still in good condition um, but the shell of the building um, is not very functional or efficient any longer. So those were the two options that um, Taylor will be talking about. And what they do is they use a process called choosing by advantages, and that's where Taylor is the expert. So this is where I'm gonna turn it over to her. No pressure, none at all. <laughs> uh, so my name is Taylor, uh, with Bolt for five years now. Um, just gonna walk through a little bit about choosing by advantages. Uh, it's a sound decision-making system. So it, it uses uh, definitions and principles to help guide the methodology and how the decision-making model really flows together. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to walk through just a high-level example of choosing a car to get your feet wet to understand how we ran through the process. Okay? So anybody, uh, what do you find important when you choose a vehicle? Functionality. You know, does it meet the needs that I want? You know, does it have like, you know, AM, FM stereo? Does it have you know, power windows? What are the features of it? Yeah, so give me, give me a specific feature. What are you really looking for? Well, for me, it's a truck, so it's four-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive, okay. Mileage. So high mileage? Yes, mileage. This time of year, heated seats. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, needed yeah. seats and all. Remote and, and starter. Remote, starter. <laughs> remote start. Yeah. We've been and, talking about and Bluetooth. That. You got us going now. Yep. Yep, we got you guys going. How about a heater with a heater? <laughs> yeah. Bluetooth. Okay, so let's just go with those examples. Gadgets. Okay, so let's just say that these are our top four important factors that we wanted to look at. Okay, so what's descriptive about high gas mileage? What, what would be specific to high gas mileage? Is there a certain range you're looking for? Does it have to be above a certain NPG? Above 35. Yeah, so. Greater than 35. Yeah, that's 18 to 20. <laughs> 20 would be nice. Yeah, not in town, right, man? <laughs> What about heating? What's important about heating? What specific to heating? Well, heated, heated seats, heated it's seats. a comfort comfort level thing and uh, as far as... Um, Speed. You know, quick to heat up. Quick to heat up. Um, you know, it kind of goes with the remote starter thing so that the car is ready to go when you're ready to go. So faster heating is yep. better. Mm -hmm. What about Bluetooth? Just convenience. Convenience, yes. convenience of you know, either talking or music or just the connectivity. The PD would probably like me to talk about, you know, Safety hands hands-free hands -free, uh, yeah. driving they would probably like me to talk about. So you can show that one on there, safety. Yeah, that's a So these are they're the buckets where you can really talk about the specifics of what you want. So <coughs> maybe you can get even more specific in this situation and say there's highway versus city miles per gallon and that and so on and so forth. 
but we really wanted to get to you high level and then if it doesn't meet this criteria then we know that the options that we look at we can eliminate okay so let's name a couple of models of trucks let's say that we're looking at so what kind of makes can we look oh well, you got chevy ford dodge toyota okay. Do the top three. Yep. Chevy, Ford, and Dodge. All right. And just off the top of your head, which one of these wouldn't be able to meet any of these criteria? None of them can meet the gas mileage criteria. <laughs> I was just going to say. Maybe she put Honda on there. <laughs> I was going to say, we might have to look at hybrids. So, expand your search right till you get something right. that meets the criteria okay so right off the bat we noticed well not an option right so we had to start looking elsewhere and getting more options available okay so if it doesn't meet criteria you eliminate that option right from there you go to importance i'll throw a hybrid on there okay so of these four which would be the most important? Mm. Depends on Safety. who you are. On, Safety. On. Yeah, that's a very good point. It depends on who you are, right? Yeah. So if you're a family making this decision, you have to account for every individual who's going to be using that vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing for the building. You have to account for everybody who's going to be using that building, okay? So let's just say we have a family of four and Nobody is under the age of 10, okay? So what, what would be most important for this vehicle, for a family in that situation? Well, probably for a family, it would probably be the bottom three. You know, heated seats would be nice for, normally they're the front seats, not the back, but I guess now they're making them in the back seats, so. But I just think more, um, you know, family and is, is Matt mentioned, you know, using the Bluetooth and the, the hands-free, those types of things. It makes the, the vehicle more of a family vehicle because you can set up two or three cell phones, I think, on, a, on those things now on the Bluetooth yeah. there, you know. And so more people can have the option of uh, using things within the vehicle. So right. for a family. It's a family safety. Safety is going to be. So yep. wouldn't that four-wheel drive piece of it be the higher safety issue? Uh, it would be more for um, what you use it for, you know, towing, uh, going. And or it might be more important to a family for budget, yeah. you know, the, the gas mileage. Yep, yep. So safety, and, safety and budget, so the gas mileage is going to become an issue. Sure. All right. But it does. It depends on who it is. And is it your primary car for the family, or is it a secondary recreational yep. vehicle like uh, they're talking about? Right. So, so it's going to depend. Yeah. So let's say you can only pick one, and they live here in Wisconsin, okay? And they have a second vehicle, but it's a small economy car that they've had forever, and they keep it around because it, they don't have to make payments on it. Four-wheel drive is probably my number one on that one, living in Wisconsin. All right. After yesterday. After. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our most important, okay? So then from there, you're going to pick the next most important throughout the list, right? And they're all going to get a certain weight compared to this guy. Okay, so what would be half as important as the four-wheel drive? Safety. You want, if it's a family vehicle and you got the family in it, you want to make sure that it has as many safety features, you know, um, obviously, I'll have to have seat belts and things now, but I, th I think the fact that um, you know ease of getting in and out of the vehicle, um, you know the use of the vehicle, does it have good you know vision when you're driving it? You know, because multiple people may be driving it, so that that's important. Um, safety factor, I think, would be pretty high up there. More than more than half is important, you would say. No, I'd say it's about the same. You know, I mean, 
for me, it all comes down to what I, when I look for a vehicle. One is cost. We didn't even talk about that. <laughs> but um, does it have the features and the functions that I want it to have for what I want it for? And so, really, I couldn't really say one's more important than the other because they all kind of, for me, they would all intertwine. Okay, so the safety's pretty high up there yep. then as well. Yep. I mean, when you look at what's out, you know, and the vehicles that are out and about driving around, you know, sometimes the bigger vehicle is a little more safety because it can handle maybe an accident better than a smaller vehicle, compact vehicle. So apparently, styling is not important to people anymore. I don't think so. They all look alike anyway. Yeah, they all do pretty much. Styling is not what it used to be, but right. so at that point, you could say the importance of style is so small that at this point, it would be considered zero. For the but but if you're using it as a, as a family vehicle, then obviously gas mileage can play into it because you're going to be u maybe hauling kids to and from activities. Uh, you may use it as a taking your family vacations. So the more gas mileage you get, the the better. Uh, obviously, that can play into it too. So mm -hmm. so if we're marking these two as one of the highest ones, you'd say gas mileage would be. I would sure not you know, as high, but no. Okay. But even in the in the in the truck truck thing um, you know you, you could pretty much say the Chevy's are between 18 and 20 the Ford's have been promoting 20, 19 and 22 and Dodge has been notorious for pretty poor gas mileage but then the Hondas and the hybrids seem to get a little bit of gas mileage. And, and that's where we get into our next part so we say we have these two we have Hondas and hybrids because these other three didn't meet the gas mileage criteria so we had to look at other things right so between the two, just for the example, you would say which has the advantage over the other in this situation? Would it be Honda or hybrid? Let's just say for the sake of gas mileage. Probably hybrid. Hybrid. Okay. So that means in this situation, hybrid would get the points for gas mileage, whereas in the four-wheel drive and the safety, let's just say the Honda beats the hybrid instead. Okay, so in these two factors, Honda would get points. In the miles per gallon factor, the hybrid would get points. Okay, wherever one option has an advantage, that's where you award the points. Okay, and that is a factor by factor basis. When all is said and done, you total up the points. Whichever one has the most points relative to cost, cost comes in at the end, that's where you start to make your decisions. Okay. So that being said, does anybody have any questions before I dive into the rest of the presentation? Let's get into parks. Okay. All right. So we used a tool called Paramount Decisions. It's just the software online that helps facilitate the choosing by advantages process. It starts by defining the factors that we walked through in the beginning. And then we <coughs> do our criteria, um, the things that either it's a check yes or no. If it doesn't mean it, it's not an option that we pursue. Okay. Then we move to every alternative, okay? they each have a specific attribute, some defining factor, okay? and each one responds to each criteria. Now, hold on a second. Regardless of whether or not the criteria was a want or a must? So in the CBA language, want um, would be should, must would be need, so if it doesn't meet a must, then you get rid of it. A should is treated as a wish list item. So mm -hmm. if it doesn't meet a should, it doesn't necessarily exclude it, per se, right off the bat. But if there are others that have more advantage in the should criteria, it would still lose out if that were the case. The least preferred between the attributes is identified that is this uh, 
dotted one here. And then the one that does not have an advantage, it's no advantage statement. With that, every advantage statement gets weighted. So you identify the most important one first. And the important one gets? 100, okay. generally. If you have many, many factors, you could make it larger. If you only have five factors, you can make it smaller. But we choose 100 because it's easy to think in percentages. So that's usually why we choose 100. And then every advantage statement after that is weighed against the top number one. So we can look at all of the advantage statements. Those are pages 11 to 13 in the report. So we can walk through the weights of each of those. Okay. I don't know if you had, you guys had passed that no, around. No, I believe it's, that's sure. in the other packages, right? Right. Are they there? You, the yep. council has those, and I see Matt. I don't have it. I just oh, have. Oh, the, we received it ahead of time. While back. Okay, we don't have them with us, but we can probably go through it. It's okay. Maybe you could just. I can make talk some about extras. Them. I don't have them personally on me. Um, oh. We'll make some real quick. My stock um, tips are on there. Careful. Okay. But the idea behind it, Taylor, is that the one you pick the most important like in this case four-wheel drive and safety they would get a weight of 100 other ones would get lesser weights then when you're doing going through this process uh depending on what number uh weight is in the category it's all it's a all or nothing you the the advantage one it's all the points right you don't split the points <clears throat> between the two advantages if we had a situation where we had all three advantages, there would still be one that had nothing, then the other two would still get points. But because we only had two options, one gets zero, the other gets points. So I guess <clears throat> moving back before that, how is it that there were only two options? The option to move into I know the they removed the, the one about using another space, but how is it that we only had two alternatives to look at? the decision was made that we were going to stay on that site um, i think we had that discussion when the field operations facility was constructed um, as far as sharing of staff or sharing of equipment um, accessibility to get throughout the city um, so that's when the determination was that was going to be the site so once the field ops was determined that it wouldn't work out because of future growth the only other option is to e possibly utilize some of the existing building or to demolish well, that's Pollution. not the only other option, though, right? We know that there are other buildings in the city. Well, city-owned buildings that would work? We didn't get to the vetting it out. I'm asking how we ended up with only two options. Well, before, well years ago, before you were on council, <coughs> council had made a decision that we would probably look at expanding either the existing parks. So we bought some property over there already. We bought some houses that were up for sale. And then we uh, also did some other, I think, land. We had one small landlocked parcel right. um, just to the south of us that we acquired. It's right. been in the CIP um, probably eight years, I think, that just keeps getting bumped back. Right. Um, so it was identified at that point. Yeah, identified as that would be the location of the Parks Department going forward. That was before you were on council. No, that can change. I mean, council can make a different decision with different council members. But at this point, we would have to make a change as a council because it was pretty much determined four or five years ago that that was going to be the site for any remodeling of the Parks Department because of the central garage and proximity of usage. But like I said, that can always change when, council, when you have council. That's why every two years or every year things can change because you have different council members and different ideas and perspectives. And, things like that so we have to be open to that but I think this study was done with the idea because when it was brought to the Parks Board it was brought forward with the idea that that the building was insufficient it didn't meet the needs of, of the parks and forestry at this point 
and something needed to be done. So the Band-Aid approach was the HVAC and stuff because there was gas permitting into the building and things like that that were causing issues and that the building <coughs> lacked the size that we need for the equipment and the depart and the size of, of, of the department. How many full-time employees we now have in just parks? Just parks, we have um, 13 field staff. Full-time year-round? Yes. In forestry, we have? Forestry, we have four field staff. Cemetery, okay. we have an additional two. Okay. Okay. So yeah. we went through this exercise with the field operations facility as far as location, and that's why we put it in the center of the, basically in the center of the city. Right. Correct. And that, I just look no back at location that was yeah, really logic. I look back at my notes. That was in 2012 right. when that mm -hmm. was taking place. Um, at one point, we had considered possibly looking at um, closing off Idaho Street and making it more of a campus in that right. area. But I believe there's some storm sewer and some other infrastructure underneath that would right. have been too cost prohibitive to close down Idaho and make it into a campus area. Correct. And then yeah. with the water department across the street, it kind of did have that kind of campus that all our main facilities were centrally located within the central part of the city. And maybe the senior uh, members here can enlighten me. So were there ever discussions previously about looking at, I, I mean, I don't know what the price tag's gonna be on this, but um, looking at things like <clears throat> those senior center buildings and some of those spaces and or other buildings um, in that area. I guess maybe those things have already been discussed. I just was asking how we ended up with only these two um, without <clears throat> any kind of, you know, and the senior center has its own um, build-out plan for, I think you're referring to the, the cold storage. Or the, the north, the pulse, yeah. yeah. The, the open right. and previous storage About the same area. time we were working on this, the senior center was doing its own study to say what could happen once um, the fields op was done because a lot of the um, equipment and certain things were being stored there. When that got moved out, it opened up an opportunity for the senior center to say, now we can build out into these areas for the growing senior population. The, and the senior, the senior center uh, prior to Ray's arrival was a separate department. And uh, when we did some uh, reorganization, Ray had some experience in, in senior services on the recreation side of his resume. Uh, but senior centers are more programmatic facilities versus uh, the park facilities are really a maintenance type of facility. So they're, they're, they're two completely different animals and <clears throat> keeping them separate makes sense because uh, the maintenance operations would essentially be incompatible with the programmatic side. Uh, even in a parks and recreation department, generally the recreation is separated from the parks except when it comes to say maintenance type of services and then they, then they get centralized. But recreation is typically service delivery uh, to the individuals versus park services which are more just general services to uh, the, the general population. Not and I just throw those right. out as two other possibilities as a question mark. Did we look at other buildings, either city owned or privately owned? Again, I don't know what we're gonna get to on the price tag and I don't wanna hold up this discussion, um, but it seems like we're spending a lot of time figuring out how we came to uh, you know, give pluses or minuses in this methodology, but um, maybe we need to just proceed I have a comment on that at least though because um, I happen to agree with with Deputy Mayor Palmieri there is a third option uh, it's built new on a new site um, whether decisions that were made nearly seven years ago were good or bad at that time or they're good or bad now it, there is a third option and it would be to build on a new site it's a completely different cost structure lots of other variables that go into it of course but there is a third option it's, it, it's not addressed and it could be or should be. Well, the, the criteria for evaluating a site would be its location and how uh, it would serve the, the general area. And that issue was discussed, and that's why Central Garage uh, Field Ops stayed where it was. Uh, Ken Robel, who is on the county board, who was our Kevin Ewan uh, uh, until 1992, I believe, um, you know, Ken always spoke about the wisdom of uh, field ops being proximate to all the bridges in town. And for an event like yesterday, having access to all the bridges makes sense. In the case of parks, similarly, uh, it's, it's central to our park system. South Park is our 
flagship park on the south side and Menominee Park is our flagship on the north, but also our other parks. It's proximate to our cemetery. Uh, <coughs> senior center was not as big a factor because that's more of a service uh, delivery to individuals. So that didn't factor in. Uh, and Ray had just taken it over when, when we started doing this. In, but in, the idea, the, the, the cost part, right. but is a new building is essentially a new building wherever you plant it. Right. The real Correct. issue there is land. Correct. And we own the land. Acquisition costs if needed. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest factor. Yeah, it, that's always an option. Whenever we would make a determination if it's, if it's to build new or remodel or replace as much of, that if in the end it makes sense to put it in a different location, that can always factor into it at the end. But, um, you know, so that's an option. I mean, but if it's not even identified as an option, then you don't. Well, the land is the land. But I would argue I that it is. Yeah. A building. The right. one option is build new. Mm, you okay. can put the, you can put a building anywhere, wherever anywhere. you want. And we we looked at the Public Works Field Ops facility. We looked at a, a brand new facility on the north side. On Inferno, I think. On Inferno, yeah. yes. That, yeah. that, and ultimately, it was like that was chosen not to be. <clears throat> the only advantage was it was a clean. It was a clean slate that you could work on other than that from a proximity standpoint um, it didn't well, really offer any real advantage except for proximity to the dump for the refuse operations that was about the only real advantage that that site offered but theoretically what if the university was willing to let go of the old cub foods that's in that same proximity centralized location right. you but know, it's not up for sale at this well, point i'm just saying yeah you Did we look at what those other options were? I don't need one. It would not make, yeah, in my opinion, make sense to look at an option that's not even available, viable, or available. Right. Our needs for our park system, our, our needs for this facility, are now, and we have to take a look at the options. Plus, we have a site that we control. Anytime we have sites that we control, that's a much more advantageous option than to uh, go out and look at other other <coughs> locations. Unless that location was was wrong from a strategic standpoint, strategically. But, but we did this in a situation for development for Ashcraft Corporation, something that wasn't previously, you know, it became right after discussions. Well, I mean, yeah, but the site is right. But to your point, and I'll I'll, I'll be in the park trip. If in the end we determine we are going to build new. And the council members feel that the site location is not correct, then we go look for another location. That's an option. And same thing with uh, options of maybe we do approach the university and say, "Hey, we want that building. Move." Well, you know, you figure out where you're going. We want that building. <laughs> Image domain. We did give Fitz enough time to I mean, get this copied for you. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. That, so the options are all there. They're always on the table. Ray, how many acres do you have right now? Oh, Mayor, that one I don't have. Yeah, um, yeah close, close counts. My point is to acquire that a parcel that size. What's the price tag? Oh, it you, depends on where it is. Yeah, but I'm saying there's. You'd want something central, and you'd want something, and the cost of site acquisition, whenever we're in the business, is going to cost more than. Uh, private sector would because we have the they have the right of eminent domain but we also have the cost of eminent domain so anytime you can have a site available to you which meets your needs there's there is no apparent need to consider another site when this is proximate to not everything only, not only our facilities but again coordination with DPW and streets for maintenance of equipment if we have a large truck that goes down we take it across the street. Um, use of use of employees across divisions and departments. So what I hear, so what I'm hearing is that there could have been an opportunity when we built Central Garage to provide for this, but maybe we didn't that because option. it needs to be tied to DPW. Is that what I'm hearing? We we looked at incorporating parks into that facility mm -hmm. but again with the future growth of all those divisions that are over there it was determined that they needed their build out space right i hear what you're saying but maybe we felt short when we planned 
that building. No, no, no. no. It was never. You're second guessing when, what happened. When the building well, was built. thought through very thoroughly for a number of years. When the building was built, Deputy Mayor, it was determined that the Parks Department would not be part of that facility because the, there was not sufficient land available for 10, 15, 20 years down the line for that department and all the other departments. It meets the needs now of Department of Public Works and future expansion. So that's when council said, no, we're not gonna go buy, you know, Cozida, we're not gonna go buy more land so that they could be part of that because we already own across the street. So the proximity of across the street for that crossover gave us sufficient land for putting the building where it was already. So I'm confused. Are we saying you do need to be next to DPW or you don't? It's convenient and efficient for us to okay. remain at our current location for cross division okay. and department use. Gas, the gas pumps are right there. Our guys use the gas pumps every day. So would that then, should that have been part of the criteria, the proximity? No, because both the two, the two items we're looking at are both on the same site. So one is demolish and one is uh, rebuild and <clears throat> retrofit. Retrofit. So one is completely build new and one is retrofit. So there. So the site would be uh, it may be higher or low criteria, but it would be absolutely equal. So you don't you don't put ones in that are you know are equal. Right. They end up getting no points um, as part of the overall process. It was looked at up front. Um, be, but because it was determined that it was going to be on the same space, it's accepted as equal, so you don't need to put it into the tally system. So do a lot of cities use um, this particular decision-making uh, methodology in their policy analysis for land use? We promote it. I haven't personally seen another one, just because I, I've only been to a handful, but we definitely promote it in all of our whether it's hospitals or whether they're choosing to acquire new land for their sites as well. We always, when, when we handle that with our customers, this is the method that we use. So maybe if you could walk through some examples of what you did to get to those, those numbers. Yep. Everybody has a copy. Yep. If you want to just, I'm familiar enough with it, I'll be okay. okay. Uh, we're on pages 11 through 13, okay. and it should be section number five, advantages. Um, so the central office operations, those, neither one had an advantage between the two because it was on the same site, so they get no points. The next one, fleet functionality. Uh, for A, demolish and build completely new. This was the most important because it had enough vehicle storage. It could allow the large vehicles because of the taller doors that we could put in with a completely new building. Um, for site B to retrofit, it, it had some storage but not enough. For image to community, Again, demolish and build completely new one out. Uh, it could complement the existing buildings around the area, whereas option B, you could assume the existing exterior, but it wouldn't blend in with the rest of the buildings in that space. Energy consumption, demolish and build new one out. Um, it met energy code. Uh, you could add in some good insulation, um, some precast paneling, uh, and option B to retrofit. It did not meet. It, at that point, it could you could replace what's already there to make it up to code, but you could make it that much better if you build new. And as you can see, the weight of importance is lower with this one just because they were so hand in hand with each other. Uh, the next one. The longevity, same, time, same idea here. Whether you refit what's already inside and get it up to code or you build completely new, you're going to get that longevity 
but that's also why we put lower weight of importance on that because they were so relatively equal. <coughs> um, the clearance height, build new one out. This goes along very closely with the very first one. Uh, you could get seven feet more clearance with building new. Um, you can meet that 19 foot clearance height with the overhead doors, uh, whereas retrofit, the existing doors are 12 feet. Um, so you're not gonna get the enough space for what you're looking for. Shop functionality, those two would have been equal, so they get no points. And service to the public, again, those would have been equal, so those get no points. Thank you. So at this point, this is where we get into the cost. <clears throat> cost comes in last in the process because you really vet out whether or not it meets your needs. Then you actually look at the price. Um, so for here, if you look at uh, section seven in the decision graph, um, option B, it did not receive any points. Option A, one out. And the cost differential, option A is at six million four and option B is at five million four. Um, so with that. Taylor, just a question. I've asked you this question before, so it's really more for the benefit of the council. Absolutely. This the option A shut out option B. Mm -hmm. Is that typical or I mean, because that it, does the methodology usually result in a, a, a shutout type of score, one option versus another? It's more common when you only end up with two alternatives. There are situations uh, where you have five or more, and that doesn't happen as often because there's more options to spread your points around. Okay. okay. But for this one, because there's only two, you one factor either gets it or it doesn't. And even if factor or option B, let's say, would have been able to fit out with the community better in that factor, that would have been one against five in that situation option A still would have had more points for you. So the conclusion would be option A wins out and that is the path that should be followed. And the cost basis for you to put a dollar number on there, is that just industry standard at the moment based on square footage? It or was based off of the original one in 2016, I believe. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that, so that's already dated by a year and a half at least. Uh, and that would have to be revisited because that's one of the dangers whenever a project like this gets dragged out over a few years <clears throat> Some of the things get lost in terms of you know the the history of where where we got where we are and then the cost gets lost um, uh, I know that happened with the public works garage because we implemented it over a three-year period rather than a one-year period And the cost went up because we had two years of inflation that we didn't uh, we didn't factor in so this is probably dated uh it will be Easily a year and a half, if, if not more. At some point, the council asked the architect to do some upgrading to the exterior of the building. Yeah, I don't recall when the process, but we said this is a public building that's going to be 75, 50 years. Let's, we're asking developers to raise the bar. I said, we, we said, let's, we should be the first raised in the bar. And typically, these costs are for the middle of the road. They're not, they're not zero, but there's certainly no, nowhere near a, Taj Mahal type of situation. And when, in the estimates of if we build new, would last roughly? Do we carry it out how many years? Roughly? Uh, was that twenty-five to thirty? Yeah, the longevity. Yeah, I, I thought <clears> that, throat> that throat> was like twenty-five to fifty somewhere. Yeah. So in build complete completely new, it's mm -hmm. uh, more than twenty-five years with a twenty-year warranty. Okay. Um, with the rebuild and closure, it's still more than twenty-five years. But the downside is there's potential cracking that could come yep. with that option. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to get more security out of building new, um, less wear and tear on using something that's been there. Right, and I guess that to me that going back to your analysis with with the vehicle, I guess longevity. I think any time we, we look at city-owned facilities, that longevity should play into it, um, along with functionality, obviously. But um, sometimes just remodeling to remodel doesn't really get you where you really want to get. Well, that's where, you know, with the two, uh, the numbers that got the, the two highest numbers, 
a 100 was assigned to fleet functionality. That was, right. you, using this analogy as opposed to four wheel drive, it mm -hmm. was fleet functionality and the other one was the, um, the clear height. And that was a, you know, must had to have 12, but want, it, it really, it should have a minimum of 15, six. And, that's, and that got a 95, so that got close to 100. Those two rose to the top as the most important, and I think that was uh, you talking with staff in terms of what? Correct, just because we have so many vehicles, one that we don't have storage for, they're either outside or um, purchasing new, we're struggling to get those vehicles inside the building because the, the height is just isn't there for us. And that can't be modified? Not with the existing, no. So it went fleet functionality, clear height, image to community. Um, I'm missing one. Oh, what were the points for image to community? Image to community was 75. 35. And then energy consumption was 55. And longevity was 35. Energy consumption was below priority than I think it was because of where it fits in with the neighborhood. You know, the neighborhood needs. Um, that was deemed to be more important. Now, we could sit and argue over that, and we could, uh, if you wanted to argue that that should have more points, in both cases, the other option won out. Option A won out. Uh, For both situations. In both situations. So it, we could concede just like that. Well, let's put, uh, let's make energy consumption 80. All that means is option A gets. Yeah, that many more. 25 more points. Ray, how old, is it, how old is the existing building, the buildings? We, um, we did a little history checking, and from what we found, there was a building permit issued in 1962. Um, for that facility, it was a, um, a technical college facility where they had, uh, I believe, automotive um, classes offered in that facility. And then uh, we found in a uh, 1985, in one of the department newsletters that the Parks and Forestry Ops building was constructed. So there was an uh, addition made there, and I think that's officially when uh, the parks moved in in 1985. But um, 1962 was the earliest we found a building permit for. So whether we move forward with new or rebuild, what kind of timelines are we looking at? I mean, for budgetary purposes, are you looking at something in 2020, 2021? This falls into that category that uh, Finance Director Larson and I categorized as favorable economic conditions. We do not have this in our five-year CIP. This was listed in year two of our CIP as one of those types of projects, which include Ninth Avenue, something with Riverwalk, Pioneer. Uh, the Southwest Industrial Park was in that list until we, at the very end, because of the, the imminency of uh, what was going on with um, Wisconsin Southern and Watco and the Transload, the council authorized putting that in the CIP. But uh, I try to remember the museum project. So they're all in this kind of limbo type of situation. We don't have this specifically budgeted, but uh, it's absolutely in need. It's not going away. Um, and you know, a, a million dollar difference um, gives us much more functionality, but we have to find the money first. And we don't, and that's part of um, the goal that I ask council when you ask me what, what goal do you want, how do we fit these in yet still work on our debt management issue because this is, this is a real situation that, um, if you recall Mr. Davis and I during uh, strategic planning and the, the exercise was what's the worst thing could happen in our Worst case scenario is all these things have to get done right away. And where do you find six million for this, ten million for a river walk and a seawall, and and you have to do Ninth Avenue, and we need the museum to get done. You're talking twenty, thirty million dollars. Where do you get that from? That is as scary a scenario to me as um, uh, something else that we didn't anticipate. So we've got to figure out a way to to weave these into our CIP within our existing um, limitations. It's, that's the tougher answer. Well, I guess um, the, the thinking then is, is obviously the project's not gonna get any cheaper whether we pick project A or project B of the project. So I guess, um, so we know 
from your end, there's really not a whole lot we can make decisions on other than when we know we can move forward, then we have to make a decision of whether we want a, a brand new facility or we want to rehab the facility we currently have. I guess the idea behind this exercise would be if we're going to do it, which one would we do? And I think the recommendations are we would do the demolish and build new, but the first thing we'd have to do after that decision's made is we have to modernize the cost. Uh, what would it be in 2019 dollars? And then keep that number updated depending on where we program it in. With what Ms. Larson and I are going to be doing this year, I think you're going to see, look, we need to budget X amount of dollars, and it's X amount, and it's seven or eight figures that we're talking about. How do we program all those in over the next 10 to 15 years? So well, did we look at the cost of doing nothing? At zero. Well, it's not because there's maintenance issues that would have to be addressed, so it's right. not zero. But I get so your, usually I get in your a point policy of analysis, zero. there's a not. do nothing. You're asking about something that was done several years ago. We, we didn't bring that back because we weren't asked to revisit an issue that the council made several years ago it was working off of that. Uh, we didn't have the resources to to even do this study back then. So it was just, okay, we know that we got to do something with parks. So what's the next step? And the next step was to analyze where we would do it. Keeping it here was the decision that was made. So that's where it is in the CIP, but you said it's outside of the CIP. So if we knew we had to do it back then, why didn't we put it in the CIP? Because we don't have the money. Mr. Urban, I think you led the charge, I think it was like two years ago, when we identified the HVAC issue. There were several other things in that report, I think, right. there that needed to be addressed, and we either held off or we addressed some. We addressed the HVAC. That was the most pressing. Correct. I think that was about 50000 that we threw at it okay. last year. All right. And then the roof is actually in pretty good shape, but there's several plumbing issues. There's several electrical issues. Um, there's some site issues. Uh, I don't have that cost in front of me. No, I'm not asking but, for that. But I mean, I guess it, it scored a 40 for a reason on that zero to 100. Right. It, it ranked right. I guess the a, worst. For to go back to the deputy mayor's question is, I guess where we're in a kind of limbo, what where the money would come from. I guess would it make any sense to revisit? You know, because it might be five years. So in the next five years, what do we have to spend to maintain to maintain the building and make it as functional as possible for the departments that work out of the parks department. And if is that three hundred thousand dollars? Is that five hundred thousand dollars? Is it a hundred thousand? You know, because we you know we have a facility that needs to be replaced. We don't exactly know whether it's option A or B at this point. We, you know, obviously I would say budget for the higher end. We can always a little extra money is not a bad thing to have available if we don't need it. But at the same time, we need to have, you know, if it's, you know, we got to bid it out, I guess, to have, or Bolt would at least give us our initial cost factors where we are now. And then to, to both um, the, the Deputy Mayor and, and, and Council Member Mugrauer, and I, I guess I'd like to know too, in the next four or five years, we can't build it till then, what is it going to cost us to maintain that facility and make it as functional as possible? Assuming nothing catastrophic happens. Well, all that, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I guess if that's identified in that, if, if Mr. Urban and his staff can, and maybe our, our maintenance staff can identify, you know, this is a critical issue here. It sounds like from what they've done, the structural part, the beams and all that, the building's not going to fall down on us in the next four or five years. But at the same time, we're, we're at the same spot of inadequacies, not functioning the way we want it to, um, appearance into the community, you know, some of those types of things still play into it. I think the issue is it barely met code when we moved uh, Ray over there on a temp. I mean, it was intended to be um, a short term uh, <coughs> situation. At the time, it came down to money. I mean, you're asking why didn't we do it? It really came down to money. We were looking at 15 to 20 million dollars on a public works garage, and that was a big thing for us to absorb. and how many of these can we absorb? And then, quite honestly, relative to the public works garage, parks looked pretty good. <laughs> and I remember the night we took the council through the old public works facility, and Ray had a conversation with me and said, 
we need to show council the parks facility as well. And it was like, yeah, that's pretty bad, but boy, not as bad as public works. And so the focus was on public works. Now that the public works needs have been met, now it's now parks does stand out more because relatively speaking, it looks worse. It doesn't look any worse than it really did six years ago. It hasn't deteriorated in six years. It's just more, it stands out more. And all the deficiencies in that building, you know, Ray has to go to uh, John Urban and say, we got to get these things. And we made a decision to add some, the HVAC. Was there anything else I thought? Was it the HVAC? No, it was the HVAC. That okay. was the big concern. Ventilation of areas. That was an emergency, wasn't it? I mean, it, it was darn near an emergency, yeah. It's a and, and safety related issue. I mean, we, we talk about, as Trina and I call it, that was a got to do. We absolutely had no choice. That, that system was just functionally not working. Um, if we make any more tweaks to the building, we're going to be getting into code issues that we won't be able to do. Uh, Frey wanted to expand another office over there. He couldn't do that. He, he would be, by code, prohibited from doing so. Um, there are exhaust issues in that building. This is primarily a small uh, engine type of maintenance facility. Uh, the big engine stuff goes over to Public Works. They take care of their small engines. And then the shop, the crafts, as, as, as you call them, Ray. Yeah, woodworking, uh, occasional welding. Yeah, we, we do all our mowers, small engines type things. And then, again, convenience, we are able to take our large vehicles across the street. I think so it's a different craft set is, think, is what I'm saying. Um, Councilmember Herman hit on the head. If we can get, and I think I saw you taking a good note there, that if we can get a cost structure of, you know, over the next, here are the anticipated p potential or projected costs for maintenance just to keep bare minimum or keep as is for the next, you know, zero to five years. Because it's not like... I'm not going to make a big assumption here. It's not like we can approve this for, you know, put it in the 2020, you know, right. CIP immediately. It's at least a year out. So we know there's going to be some other maintenance costs. Show those to us so that can be part of the equation as to what is the best thing moving forward. Because really it's going to come down to funding more than, more than a decision of whether it needs it or not will be a funding source, I think, probably more than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's essentially we, that We can agree that the building has major deficiencies. And there's definitely more uh, efficient. Yeah, it's not a question of if; it's yeah. a question of when. When, right. but how do and we how. how do we budget and, and how. how do we prioritize the budgeting of it? Because we know that there's some city hall stuff we're going to see in an hour, along with police mm -hmm. and fire. Three minutes. Yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, over the next hour. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <coughs> help, help us prioritize our budgeting by giving us that information. Right. Right. What I what I hear you you all saying is. Um, update the numbers so we have a, an idea of what it would cost and then look at it over the next five years and then we'll have a maybe a more precise number and then depending upon what happens regarding those other projects that are kind of in the holding um, bin um, that might provide an opportunity for the council to prioritize yeah. right and, and then, then and what will the cost be five or six and then five phase million, in these projects five million based on the priority that the council six determined. million it was this queuing up of projects that I saw coming, which is what led me to say we need to look at the debt financing part because 11.4 million uh, hasn't been cutting it. And we knew that streets were going to go up, and that goes back to you know, do we how much do we press our debt limit? And it's it's um, I wish it was easy. It was like oh yeah, we can you know borrow as much as we want. We have all these needs. Let's do them. But uh, and then you know. From a policy standpoint, council will always get questioned, why did you pick this over streets? And streets are, are the, the sort of the, the, the right. top of the rung in, yep. terms, of, in but, terms of what projects should get done. To, to what Mr. Fitzpatrick said, I think that, that is the, uh, the way to go, though, so that council can have the, the options to say, okay, we're prioritizing, let's just say, parks over City Hall over or the, the next big or, or the museum it would allow us to make an informed decision right informed. but leaving yes. room knowing that councils can change at every election and other council members should be able when they're on council at the time to have that option to make a decision and if they let's just say said number two should be number one and one should be number three you know when the time comes but yet the funding arm is there to put them all together in the next say 70 Eight years. 
And, and back to your and point constantly too. Constantly updating the numbers. So Correct. That not, so that Correct. Five years we kind of antiquated. Now, right, yeah. because that that's really not factual then you know mm -hmm. you, you, you need the hard factual numbers so that they can move forward if they're the company we choose to go with or whatever so that you know they they can start putting a plan you know we need to see a diagram just like we did central garage we saw all kinds of different diagrams and different things before we pretty much you know finalize what we have now and back to your point too council member herman that you were trying to make earlier i think you know we already do that with the hvac um listing so it's it's similar it's not quite the same but right. we have prioritized those projects based on need and we talk about it with the rest of the departments well right. i hear our, our budget have fewer zeros going to have some right. empty warehouses pretty soon um from what i'm hearing they're going to fill what's going to be empty are buildings that they don't own they're going to be backfilling their own buildings with the defense uh, division. The defense division is going to backfill basically all that stuff. But it goes back to strategically, is it in a good location? Because, you know, if you, on the north side, it, it, it wouldn't be as strategic. Uh, the, the only park it would be close to, uh, just, just for sake of discussion, the uh, defense area over on the north side, it's close to Menominee, and that's about it. Something on the south side, uh, it would barely be close to the south park. Uh, it, it, Anything uh, east of 41 and south of 20th is pretty isolated uh, from a strategic standpoint. And um, Ray certainly can talk more operationally about this than I can, but I know that um, there is an advantage for it to be centrally located, just as uh, field operations facility. Don't take me literal. I was... Uh, I right. It's, it's and, been the but, challenge. And I them. guess the other point I, I would add is I know, and so does City Manager Roloff, that um, parks and... Um, streets and the other divisions over there are working more and more together and I think that's something that, that certainly they want to continue to do and we think that you know we can realize more efficiency by having them work together and share different sorts of things um, so I think yeah. it is a good look so, to, so I guess my thinking is to move ahead do we have any more questions we have these folks because we have another presentation we may need another workshop just to have an overall the discussion financing, yes. financing kind of slash plan. prioritizing of all our needs sure. that's a whole different program but i know these folks have are on this one so yeah they, they want to stay on that task. well again it's like any other building that's going to be here 50 years give or take i mean they, yeah but the population the needs are today are going to be totally different 50 years from now i think we've got to be looking to the future not what's going to fill the needs Next well, that's, that's why we the put problem those priorities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the yeah, that's why there's a little bit of a, I don't know, maybe a, not a fallacy, but it's an odd way of looking at looking at the cost last because it's like, you know, I, I may need to move and buy a different house, but if I don't have the cash or the financing for that right at this moment, there's no point in me going and looking at other houses, right? And, and when we do the prioritization, you know, we can use a variety of different methods, too. I mean, we kind of use a little Delphi method when we prioritize projects right now, and it incorporates the idea how much money you have available at the time, too. And, and I think that gives council some flexibility. We wanted to try to objectify a, a subjective process that really is going to come down to what you think is going to be best um, to try to help as much as we could. But when you have all those items that City Manager Roloff talked about that have kind of been waiting it's, it, it really comes down to a tough decision for all of you to say hey this is how we're going to prioritize this and if something happens where we absolutely have to pull one of these things that is down here and move it up we, we have the flexibility yeah. to do it mm -hmm. and that's what city manager Ross talking about well I mean using the criteria you know us uh, a little a mini Cooper and a Porsche both have two seats <laughs> That's a, it really comes out of what can we afford. And, and I think the, the purpose here was, relatively speaking, that, that million dollars, what is it worth to you? Million dollars gets you a lot of advantages. And I think that was the, the purpose of this exercise was to say, would you really want to consider just retrofitting when you get clear advantages for a for million dollars more? But now uh, you can almost do a whole choosing by advantage for, City Hall, museum, parks, um, and I have you know a short list of things. Uh, 
in parks is pretty high and I'm not just saying that because FGM's not in the room yet mm. but I mean we've we've seen the facility in giving tours I mean part of the idea behind giving the tours wasn't necessarily to show it off was to show it and to let people realize yeah there's some some real issues <coughs> I mean we, we jokingly talk about how Ray names some of the the varmints the that uh, that the rodents set to occupy the place uh, and that's it doesn't have a good seal on the building that's the nature of it do we have that problem here no uh, but but we have to deal with those things but this is a real this is a real need uh, and, and this just gives us an opportunity to say if we were going to do it because it's really more if we were going to do it what would we do this seems to be it Trina and I are gonna have to figure out how do we put this into a package for council to say all right here are our priorities uh, and eventually you'll say these are our priorities I can give you my recommendation but at the end of the day you got to, the seven of you are gonna have to do that and Ray right. you can limp you can limp along for another five years but there's gonna be a cost of another HVAC yeah. that goes haywire <laughs> they're they're hiding somewhere we just don't know when they're gonna yeah it is it, it is you're right it's a question of you know really you can make, you can a make million do. versus five million to yeah. if you know maybe there's an opportunity even in looking at the city hall you know you're talking about trying to bring all staff together and you got kind of shoved over by the uh wayside over there maybe you get brought back into the fold in the Larger, I mean, I don't know. Ray knows the value of my wisdom on that. <laughs> and, it, and it paid it's off. It's paid off, yes. It's, it's paid off a great deal. The engagement that, that Ray has with the staff and uh, the collaboration, uh, and that's part of this, that's part of this too. And I think Ray's been successful in getting that collaboration. Where would you put your lawnmowers here anyway? No, I hate talking about the administrative side. I, I think you need to understand too that my management and supervisory staff just being scattered, I've got three staff members over at the senior center between Kathy Snell, Jenny, who we had to build an office for at the senior center to get her out of the amusement center down at the, you know, Menominee Park, um, and Ann Schaefer. So I've got three in a different building already. Um, Bill Sturm is pretty much in an office that was self-built out of, you know, a leaking roof and everything else. So I think that's part of it as well, just getting everybody under one roof so we can operate efficiently. So is, is, I guess my other question kind of goes back to, you know, not to beat a dead horse here, but if there was a delay in the project, you know, as a result of financial decisions, and there is expansion space that's planned for by DPW, is that expansion space usable in the interim, you know, in a kind of a hybrid scenario, I guess, it's just a rhetorical question not really expecting an answer I, I think the answer was you know, functionally speaking no because a lot of what Ray has is our smaller shops and offices the offices uh, there are no there's no office space uh, and field ops there's not yeah we really took an operational building and made it administrative and I remember when that decision was made too and I remember driving Ray around during his interview and I remember kind of, not that I was speeding, but I remember going past that facility pretty really fast. quickly and <laughs> trying to point stuff out on the other side of the road. We showed it to him after he accepted. <laughs> and we told him that, you know, this is temporary, but it's going to really help give you an opportunity to get to work with your staff and for you to connect with them and all that stuff. And it's been temporary for a, for In a glacial long terms, period it's been of very time short. now. Well, you a good point, too. Is, the, is that facility a turnoff to potential employees? You hear that from Oshkosh Corp all the time. That's why they're building a new building. It's Ray, Ray again can speak talent. better than I can. That's but, why I looked at Ray. But I, I but I, I would say, you know, I think the employees know we value them. But the longer that they're in that temporary facility, um, the more difficult it is. Would you say, Ray? That's correct. Because they don't, they don't have the setup to do the best job that they can, um, even if they desire to. So it's. It's a little bit frustrating, I would say. So I think our takeaways from this are to evaluate some of the uh, upcoming projected needs for this building and just basically show council, look, here Here are some costs that you're going to incur uh, no matter through what. inaction is essentially, and, and g give you a flavor of what that is. Uh, you know, it, maybe it behooves us to uh, do another uh, tour over there 
Um, I know a lot of you have been over there for like the open house, we have <coughs> but not. But if you'd like to take a tour again, we'd be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. We'll wait till spring. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. And I know we have FGM on the wings. They're just being polite, not uh, not coming in. So. Right. If you want to stretch your legs a second, let's do that. Give them time you, Taylor, to set Doug, up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stretch your legs. Stretch your legs. Drink of water. <laughs> the Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. 
This is GovTV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. The Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is GovTV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is GovTV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. The Oshkosh Common Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is GovTV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org. I think John can, Round, or John. I can pick it up. Round. Yeah, right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so we're now going to be talking about the space needs assessment that FGM uh, conducted for us. And just a little background on this. You might remember in 2018, the council asked for a 15-year uh, matrix review of, of city departments and where, where everyone was at in terms of facilities. Um, you know that we found all kinds of things about our buildings. We're in pretty good shape overall. But one item that did come out of that matrix review was that space needs assessments were overdue for several of our buildings and city hall um, was one of those as a primary uh, issue we wanted to get to so we engaged fgm to start that process i think it was last summer mm -hmm. last august and so they spent the last several months going through that and um, so they're going to present now what they found from that assessment and uh, the recommendations uh, for where we might go down the road okay andrew? um so like i said i'm andrew mayo i was the project manager for the study um to my right is Paul Ezeki. He's our uh, City Hall programming expert, and Brian Wright was the principal in charge. Um, so let's dive in here. Uh, here's the agenda of uh, what we'll be going through uh, for our presentation here. Um, starting out with an executive summary, um, we developed a project understanding uh, from the outset. Um, giving an idea of uh, what the building is and, and how we're going to approach um, the facilities analysis and, and uh, space needs analysis as well. <coughs> uh, 
Um, and so our methodology on that analysis of space needs, um, we gathered the information uh, both from uh, John and John and Mark um, through some documents that they were able to provide us um, as well as uh, interviews with the staff as well as members of the council um, and we hit all of the departments that are housed within City Hall. Uh, so based on all of that initial gathering, we came up with 10 project goals. Um, quickly going through those project goals. We have uh, the f future space needs, uh, space efficiency, compliance with the ADA, uh, compliance with the building code, fiscal planning, uh, the function and future needs of the city uh, and the departments within City Hall, um, the overall building systems, building security, which was uh, highlighted by, I think, every member of every department that we talked to. Um, so that was a big one, as well as uh, creating a welcoming environment in City Hall and modernizing the building overall. Uh, so after developing the project goals, we developed a list of questions that uh, we thought the study should answer. Um, is there enough space within this building to accommodate now and into the future? Um, if additional space is required, can this building function in some capacity to address part of that space need? Um, another question brought up going all the way back to the RFP was, can the City Hall's mechanical building, which is out across the parking lot, can that be utilized as some part of the solution to address any of the space needs of City Hall? Um, and then once we develop all of those, uh, how much will these solutions cost? Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Paul to delve a little more into the details of. As we go. Sure. So as a city hall programmer, one of the things we start doing right away is, as, as he mentioned here, we, we met with groups that, that are housed inside this facility. And we start talking about several things. We have a space needs analysis. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a projection on from each group of do you see your department or group decreasing, increasing? Um, what is your square foot needs now? Or do you have enough? Are you, you know, are you lacking? And, but one of the first things we start off with is, is the adjacency program, or in the program is the adjacency diagram. One of the things in that uh, when we met with each group, we asked everybody to fill this out. And one of the things we said was, which departments do you need to be near? Where do you see, which groups do you see you working a lot with? Now you can see this. It looks like a spider web. Everybody seems to be working a lot with each other in a lot of ways. That doesn't always happen with every municipal group. One thing I think is great about this, though, is that within this building, your group here has, in my opinion, set, done a really good job of setting the floors up with good adjacencies to each other already. So that's one of the things we'll delve into later as we go through these options we've looked at. But as, again, as you'll see, lots of arrows. A lot of these groups work with each other. So. How do you solve that problem? We've got a, a building that's vertical, right? We have stairwells, and everybody's got. A, there's a lot of time and travel between departments. So this is just a quick, you know, um, what do you call it? Like a glance at how everybody's working together. I'm gonna go to the next slide then. <clears throat> so one of the things you don't see is that you know when we there was a questionnaire. How many people do you have in your staff? Do you see the projected staff going from in 2018 to 2028 to 2038 to 2048? Where are we at? This pie chart is, you know, the circle represents 100% of your existing building, which is at 42,040 square feet. What we're seeing on the existing of this building, because it's a building that was designed to be a school. Schools have large corridors for kids to move in and out to classrooms. When you guys, uh, you know, basically adopted this building to become a city hall, it wasn't really a designed to be a city hall. So one of the things you're going to see is that it's got an sorry, overwhelming number when it comes to cir circulation and mechanical that cannot be attributed towards what you need for square foot for this building. 
and there's where that lack is. So you're seeing a deficiency. Based on what the departments and groups were mentioning, you're looking at around 1,100 square feet of deficiency in this, for, for at this moment as you currently exist. So the next one. So looking out to the, to where we our projections were say, can we get this building to work to 2048, a 30 year projection? Looking at the space needs from everybody's um, di um, forms they filled out, we're now looking at a 3,000 square foot deficiency. The pie, the pie chart's gonna point out though, with our options that we showed, that there is ways to de use this facility by decreasing circulation and decreasing the current use of the mechanical spaces to show a net increase that can be used towards department use. So even though it's only a 3,000 square foot deficiency, we need to recapture that 12% of inefficient space Correct. to also meet our needs. Yeah, I think the, the overarching comment <clears throat> uh, in regards to the width of the corridors and all that circulation is that in, in these options, when we looked at them, the, the good news is when you look at this building, you look at uh, uh, the, the, the quality of the building, the limestone, the historic heritage of the building, the reality is we're not that far away from the future needs reusing this building. So when we look at the options, that's one of the options that, we're, that we will we'll bring up. And another point to make on um, our space needs analysis and, and interviewing the different departments, none of the departments were outlandish with their future needs. Uh, if anything, they were pretty conservative as far as, oh, we might see an increase of one or two staff, um, or it, it might be that we create a new position, or it might be that we're the same number of staff 30 years from now, just based on the historic nature of each department. Mm -hmm. So to, to come out of the study at the end of the day, only needing an additional 3,000 square feet, I, I think that speaks to each department and their understanding of we're not getting a thousand square feet a department mm. new beyond this. So they were they were pretty conservative with their approach, which can be appreciated. So one of the uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the studies obviously is we're looking at projected growth with staff. The other aspect of this is identifying the existing conditions of this building. So from the architectural aspect of things. There's an inefficient use of space, as we pointed out with the circulation. Um, the 12 foot wide corridors really take away the possibility of using the space for other needs, for other departmental needs. The exterior envelope, we're looking at aging windows, you know, ranging in age from 20 to 40 years. Um, it, but it's a limestone veneer. It's, no one could build a building this, of this, this magnitude these days. It just would be fiscally irresponsible. <laughs> but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful edifice. Um, Accessibility. I think everybody that has used this facility knows where we're at with the restrooms. The restrooms are on, on mid-levels of stairwells. Um, there's very few ADA accessible restrooms in general. Signage. Uh, I do, there, there's issues of wayfinding, the um, hand, um, handrails and door hardware. So AD, uh, accessibility across the board, is, there's a lot of issues we have to look at. And then the building code. Um, talk to me about the, you can mention the roof framing. So um, in, in our crawling through all the different spaces <laughs> in this they building didn't wear the suits that day. Um, we understood that uh, in general um, the building would be completely fine structurally the way it is now um, the one component that is, if you were to do any work in the future would necessitate sprinklers is the fact that you go up in the attic and the roof is actually wood framed um, which would mean that it would need to be a protected building um, and that's where the sprinkler component would come into play. Sprinklers in here, aren't there? No, right. That's because we've been oh, we're grandfathered in because we've right. never made enough. Never occurred so to me. Ninety percent of the building has protected structure, so it's <coughs> encased in concrete or plaster. Whereas you get up in the attic and there's some interstitial space there that you look above your head, and it's two by wood framing. We've done so little changes in the 55 years we've been here that we haven't triggered it. But when we start doing anything these guys are talking about, we're in a whole different world. And that's the, that's the dilemma. So the good news is that we don't have a lot of space needs. The bad news is 
we got to move on. And so that's, I'm, I'm cutting to the chase and I'm sorry, right, I'm right. ruining <laughs> your presentation. Big reveal. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Spoiler yeah. alert, yeah, exactly. So if there were a fire, this place is gone. No. Well, well, well your fire department fire would fire respond. Would be in the roof, yeah. yeah. The roof will be in the basement. Mm. Well, it depends on where the, yeah, where yeah, the fire it's, occurs. Yeah. Right. We prefer to say it doesn't meet, you know, it, we're grandfathered in with current codes. Right. So that, that takes us through architecture and structure of the, of the existing conditions. Uh, getting into mechanical, um, a lot of your mechanical systems are housed in the... Uh, adjacent building over across the parking lot there, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, and the city staff has been doing a great job of maintaining and upgrading as necessary. Um, but uh, our, our consultants in their findings sort of gave us a rundown on uh, what systems probably should be replaced. And it's not necessarily that they're not working. It's just that you, you have a lot of systems that may be nearing end of life, um, so that's something to think about as you go forward. Uh, air handler is serving this building just with one unit, um, and the temperature control system is, some of it's been changed over to digital controls. Uh, a lot of it is still on pneumatic controls, and there's sort of a... a, a the hybrids. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's difficult to discern how things are actually being controlled uh, w with the best economy in mind. And that goes back to having one system here where uh, you really, you, you can't really efficient. make the most of efficiencies. And piecemeal improvements. I mean, mm -hmm. yes. that's what we've been doing over Yeah, and one of the improvements being you had a boiler repla replaced in 2014. Um, the cooling plant's been replaced in great condition um, so like I said it city staff has been doing a great job upgrading and maintaining but uh, at the end of the day a lot of it is going to be band-aid solutions until you can whole building approach and, and give better controls to those new systems <sighs> getting into the electrical um, the electrical distribution uh, you're dealing with some obsolete breakers, uh, obsolete being that uh, if you were to have to replace anything, you're not going to find those parts anymore, so you're going to have to upgrade the whole box, not just one circuit. Um, however, you do have a, a brand new generator out there, um, but uh, on the downside of that brand new generator, the switchboard that it's connected to is older and probably should be replaced. I'm going to hand it back over to Paul to walk you through the three design options that we came up with. So as Brian mentioned a couple of minutes ago, in our mind as an architect, we think this is a beautiful building. So again, the great news is we think this building should be reused. I think that's a no-brainer from our end. And I think that I think the analysis we did on both, you know, investigating the existing building and then looking at the space needs of the city we felt like this was we were there if we felt like this was the best option we have two other up we have other options we're not going to show one is sitting there doing nothing and another one could be build a new building somewhere but i don't think that's the, the right answer we'd want to present to you i think in our due diligence and looking where we we're at there's that threshold and we're looking at a beautiful neighborhood you're looking at the being in, in a neighborhood with the public safety you've got a campus I, I, there's a there's a lot of amenities to staying here in our minds and so <clears throat> with that, we, we obviously these, these, these um, goals were set in mind, and this is what we're trying to address with our options. And which options can hit all the goals and which ones don't hit all of them. So, and we'll, get, we'll, we'll keep going back to the goals because I think it's a big um, topic we need to keep you know, discussing here. So in, in option one, we're starting with the biggest, what I would say is the biggest impact. So option one is addressing a lot of the goals. It's what's well, actually hitting all of them. Some of the things we need to talk about is the inefficiency in space, the inefficiency in ADA and code compliances, um, security for the building, public wayfinding, being in a welcoming environment, and building modern, modernization. Those are just seven of the ten points. So in this option, what we're looking at is 
Some of the, or some key elements we'll use in options one through three, you'll see. And what those are, are relocating stairwells and the restrooms to be more in a core of the building. Thus, they become easily more accessible and um, it, it helps with cutting down the square foot to be allocated towards the use of other departments again. In the scheme, you're going to see what we call an addition to the, to the back side of the building. When, I, when we talk about programming for city halls, one of the things we look at a lot is how do we become a welcoming, welcoming to the citizen, yet also provide security to both the, the staff and the visitors who come. So in this option, what I'm looking at on, on the, the plan on the left, that's floor, the first floor, is adding a council chambers to that main floor. It is a, an element, in addition to the building, that serves as a, a, a new entrance to the parking lot. It is a public wayfinding, and it is also a council chambers. So now we no longer have people in our minds traveling up an elevator and stairwells to other full levels of, and it keeps, now there's a, a sheer, I guess what I'd say, a, a, a strong delineation between where the public goes and where the, and the, and the, the staff goes. And, and one consideration <coughs> is, again, one of the goals was security. So if you, if you take an evening uh, like tonight, for example, uh, you know, the, the ability in this scheme to close off the rest of the building, to keep the public from wandering the building, is, is one of the key factors that this option would provide. And of course it also puts us, uh, you know, in a somewhat vulnerable position as well, security speaking. Right. I think the idea too that we discussed was we wanted to make it as easy and accessible for the public as we could. Exactly. ADA wise. Yeah. And then that way they could they could be right there. Yep. But is that so is that showing the it's, it, I'm trying to figure out if the the counter for you know services <clears throat> would be directly available I can't quite make this out what that color is is that beige or behind the purple and option one first floor oh, that core. yeah maybe walk somebody through the building like what you'd see with the so if I came in if that purple was council chambers mm -hmm. just behind that is showing that color as Oshkosh media rather than coming into the um, the um, general services where you pay your parking That's Oh, that's circulation. Circulation. Colors are throwing me off too. Yeah, yeah the, it, maybe that's why I'm confused. And they read different on everybody's computers, and, and they print differently. So we do okay. apologize about that. It's hard because we're seeing an existing building um, that portion that looks like a, a, a plan, and then what we're doing here is more schematic about saying here's adjacencies based off that that adjacency diagrams and what we were thinking. So it, it, though we're showing some stairwells um, and some restrooms. Please try to think more about how the, how they relate to each other, vertically and from um, public versus private, you know, uh, circulation. So again, what I was seeing here is that in some ways people are walking in. Where is that entrance? That's not that we don't have that spot right now. It's on that main level from sure. the parking lot, and then you're going to have be greeted by some, maybe a person, maybe a security guard at night when there's a co the council chambers because you would have a security guard, right? <coughs> then that's that that is it, I, in my opinion. It, it, it brings a more, it's, it's a space that's for the people now. It's right there. More like a meandering. town hall. It's our mm -hmm. town hall, right. right? Right. So, and what we then say then is that, if you can imagine, we're looking at, this is the public circulation going all the way around, but that could be shut off at night so no one's meandering. During the day, everybody has locations to go to, to visit, once they've met that first person at the front, saying, can I help you? Do you need to just okay. fill out a form? You can go to this department. What this building has, which is very similar to so many city halls, is that someone's go, well, go up the stairs and go to room 404, and you're sitting there meandering, and the reality is, in today's society, that's a danger to your, to your employees right. and to other visitors. So it's about controlling here. And that's one of the big goals of this was security. Public wayfinding and security hits us right away. Okay. So we... Again, we can go, the, the op, this option and the other options, you're always going to see these stairs moved and the restrooms moved inboard because you don't want men at one end and women at the other end and on, and on half flights. You want elevators that are large enough to get people up and down. 
right? That hits the circulation aspect and decreases circulation to, to attribute it back to departmental use. Go ahead with your question. I'm sorry. No, no. no go ahead. So in the grand scheme of things for this dialogue, we can sit there and say this is finance, and we can say this. The colors don't necessarily mean something right now. What I will tell you, though, is that these are very close to what you currently have in this space because as we did, you know, investigated and then analyzed this, I thought the, your group has done a wonderful job with adjacencies in a vertical building. You know, we've, uh, we've designed a lot of city halls that are all on one level and you do a lot of traveling. Um, so we did believe in a lot of the adjacencies that are already working because what we heard from start talking to everybody is that we liked how they worked. <laughs> we liked that we were with certain groups. Yeah, so, you know, to <clears throat> piggyback on that, the issue was not necessarily where the departments were in the building. It was that within each department, there was an inefficiency of space layout, storage, and other filing, et, et cetera. So a lot of these plans resolve that, but really kind of keep the departments in, in very similar locations to where they are now, but with a much more efficient layout. So you can see faintly through each plan, there was this big 12-foot corridor that goes across the whole space. This is probably the one that has the most circulation because it's attributed to the public. Every other floor, you'll see it being decreased. And you, you maybe just even hit the next slide just to show the next two floors. Again, the other, the other thing that we've done on each floor, and every department asked for this, was more meeting space, more... Right. It, and it doesn't have to be within the department. It can be. Right. And that, that's what we're showing with a lot of this shared space, which is the orange color. And to his point, which is really important, again, going back to needs of the staff, but also security, is that we see a lot of times, like in planning and zoning, well, I need someone to come visit me. I just told them to put a chair down on my desk. In the grand scheme of things, that's probably not what we want. So uh, coming up with more shared space, but someone say, okay, I want you to go to this room. We're going to meet you there. It gets both people into a common ground. Okay. The other thing I would add, too, you know, that was a common theme, I think, from staff. And also, a, we thought a great suggestion from FGM is, you know, the old model of transacting business across a counter. It kind of creates this kind of... Physical barrier. Physical barrier and kind of us versus them mentality. But with uh, one of the things that we thought was a, a beautiful suggestion by FGM with adding additional meeting spaces, we have the opportunity to sit down with the citizen in a shared space, a meeting space, you know, try to help them and provide what we felt was, you know, better customer service, hear their concerns. It wasn't that confrontational, traditional, here's the counter, I'm here and you're there. Um, it just provided more opportunities to work a little bit more efficiently <coughs> but I guess with the citizens. But I guess, you know, I would have, and maybe this is getting too specific, but a question like, for example, doesn't inspections and planning have more walk-up traffic than, say, finance? Like when we look at which floor, who's on what, because otherwise you're still going to have folks. Yeah, so you, you still have the ability to have that transaction counter. What this space, what our, actually all of our options do this, they afford you that additional space, which we're calling shared space right now, that can be divvied up into smaller conference rooms, meeting rooms. So then it's just push the button and they come down to you? Is that what you're thinking? Not necessarily. It, it could be that they're going up to whatever floor that that particular department's on. And um, if you, for example, if you know it's going to be someone who is a little irate about their bill or about not getting approval or something like that, you could say, okay, we're going to meet in room 404, um, and we're going to sit down and talk about this. That way, it's a one-on-one -on -one discussion, sure. but it's also out of the public realm. Yeah, so it brings it helps with confidentiality. Sure. And, you know, right now, you know. you got to listen to the yeah, guy talking about he's going to redesign his toilet. The whole, you know? the whole, whole world can hear you, right? Yeah. So, right. Um, so that'll be every nice for customers. every conversation on floor. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah. You guys know you're, you have your office there, so. I would say volume-wise, they're about equal because oh. you get so much transaction with the, the payment function uh, on the first floor. Uh, think of utility bills, although, you know, we're hoping that people will go. But not finance department, right? They don't do that in there, right? They collections. do it out of the county. <laughs> oh, they do. Yeah, yeah collections. Oh, I they thought all of that went through the. Are we here to look at concept or allocate space? We're looking at concepts for two, three different options. Right. Not necessarily. I mean, it, I, I understand that. 
it's like I said, it can be, it makes you want to get into the weeds a little bit and say, does this department need to be on third or fourth? You know, we can talk okay. about those things, but I think it's about the options on how each one addresses the goals. I, you know, I want to keep stressing our goals for this. And, and, and again, this, the option one is going to hit all the goals. It hits your, your wayfinding. It hits your, your uh, security for your, for both, you know, staff and public. It, it hits code compliance, ADA concerns, upgrades to the mechanical systems all across the board. So this is the big ticket, what I would say option one, the all in to make this facility work to a 30 year projection. With option one, the one important part that you don't see with option one is the mechanicals are gone. Everything okay. over there is Whatever. gone because it's it gets relocated mm -hmm. essentially the to the roof. Yes. Oh, okay. So I apologize that, for not mentioning that. So that frees up space as well. Okay, and that's, I mean, sure. That's kind of creating space because right now it's getting Thank eaten you. up by mechanical. Because that was one on our pie chart. We talked about how big circulation is, and he helped me with this. It's mechanical will reduce net footprint in the building as well. I mean, because obviously that's a big piece inside that building on this floor. So the idea here, Paul, is maybe you can just quickly do an overview of each of the options and how they hit the goals so that when we look at the colored pages, mm -hmm. it gives a little clarity. So again, we had the three options. Um, a full dot means we're hitting it 100 percent. The the half the half you know half dot I would say is it's fringing on it. Okay. So space future space needs we're we're trying to hit. Do we have a count for the 30 year, 15 year, and five year? So in our space efficiency, we're hitting it dead on. We got all the room in the world once we do this addition and full gut renovation of this facility. And that gets you to a 2048 line. If we go with options two and three, which we have to show you, you're getting there. It's gonna get you maybe 15 years and five years. I'll explain those as we go. <clears throat> on ADA compliance, we're gonna hit that on all of them because as I mentioned, we're gonna be relocating those bathrooms and stairwells, which is the biggest issue of the ADA. So that hits across the board on all these options. Same with code compliance. They kind of go in hand in hand with each other. Um, your function and future needs. So that's where I think when we look at the space needs analysis from the, the staff, that's where we start falling a little deficient when we're not coming up with enough square footage as we get as as, as the departments grow. Building systems. We are looking at new mechanical systems across the board, so those would be hit in all of these options. <coughs> Um, building security. In the other two options we show you, we're doing nothing at that front entrance, so a lot of these pieces will stay the same. It's not hitting, having some wayfinding and a stop point that kind of creates that divide we're worried we're hoping to get. Um, a welcoming environment. Right now, I think you walk in, and it's great to see all the front the people across the, at the, the main window, and, and I think it can be welcoming. But again, as you mentioned, we're behind a counter, and I think there's times more that we can redesign that so there's better interaction, so people feel even more welcoming. And there is this gap we have to worry about. We have an older generation that likes to go to a ticket, a window to pay bills, to discuss things, and we're also looking at millennials that probably don't want to leave their house and they want to do everything online. And how do we address the needs yeah. of both? Because that is a growing thing. It is. And then building modernization. We're going to hit on portions of that across the board with all three options but on obviously with option one it hits it the most because we would be fully gutting the building do we want to go to option two then? yep okay so option two because as we noticed in that that spot pie chart that we're deficient around 3,000 square feet this option says we have to pick a department to move over and what we're thinking is we know there's space available right now in the public safety board so an option here is what department or departments could move over there to create more space within the building with the stairs being relocated and bathrooms being relocated to create the square foot needs we need. So it is not a full gut renovation. It's getting there though because we're looking at the stairs and bathrooms moving, a department moving out, and then we're looking at new walls and probably systems furniture to instead of a secretary having an old desk that's you know 10 by 10 we're looking at something that's a little bit more modern so you know and it's more space appropriate so I have a question because <clears throat> we know that anytime we open up a building that 
it's it's going to cost a lot of money <clears throat> I, I guess my question is so you guys already made the decision that for example we would not just like do an addition to the unused front or part of the parking lot or maybe that looks like you are actually going out into the parking lot a little, a little bit, bit. Yeah. option but one does mm -hmm. option yeah. one does <laughs> so but i mean in terms of adding those you know uh accessible bathrooms and and that kind of thing on to the front or the sides of the building i guess my question is is that something that even like came into play or i, I think the um the the option one that if you go back to that rectangle maybe the site plan <clears throat> so we're envisioning that 3,000 square foot addition as a uh, basically a one-story or heightened volume because uh, it's a you know your town hall is essentially mm -hmm. it would be a heightened volume but but it's a it's a one uh, story uh, yep. <clears throat> so so the, the restrooms and the stairs are all within the in the internal uh, perimeter of the existing building and part of the idea of keeping it within the framework of the existing building is I think this addition and anything that we do would be very sensitive to the aesthetics of the existing building but so to address, address your question directly about ADA compliance just putting new bathrooms in that one-story addition would not make you compliant right gotcha you need it okay. on each floor ah yes of course. And because the current bathrooms are on half levels. Right. It yeah. makes it in extremely difficult to do anything. Yeah, the, the real problem is that <clears throat> is that it's not, yeah, they're on that half level, so they're they're inaccessible. So they couldn't be placed in the interior in where all this extra hallway space is on each floor? Uh, well, they are in the interior, but they're more strategically placed along the narrower corridor that we're creating, so it's much more public publicly accessible. And to in, in our goal to in, to give more departmental use, one of the things we did was decrease circulation that was unnecessary for a city hall because we're trying to keep less people going inside the main part of the building, keep them into controlled zones, and then the rest of the corridors can be narrowed down because it's just for you know people working within the facility. Yeah. So again, that's why we try to centralize stairwells back in together, bathrooms back in together to create more space instead of having long distances between elements so one of one of the things that uh touches on what what you mentioned is right now the the corridor divides the building in half it literally bisects it and it's really really wide so that's a really inefficient use of that space this corridor is a lot less space and we recapture if you look at the purple and the blue we're recapturing all of that circulation and stair space um it, 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 you know, and bring it, giving it back to those departments. So that's where, that's one of the reasons why the building as a, as a whole actually has enough square footage. It's just a better way of recapturing. It's more efficient. It's it, more efficient. It's not set up efficient. And, well, those halls were designed for students and then nothing yes. was done yeah. in the 60s. It was designed for a school and it's a beautiful building. They didn't, they didn't shrink the halls today. back in the 60s. Well, and so building on the bisected nature of the building right now, um, there are some departments, public works and engineering in particular, that can't fit just on one side of the corridor right now. So they're spilling over to the other side. And you talk about poor design as far as efficiency and adjacency is concerned. You've got a department that's cut off by a hallway. And so if you look at the blue on the bottom there, we've, we're, we're now you know, reconsolidating them so that they can be a department. And it's all, and again, it's all because of the recapturing that, that corridor space and stair space. And, you know, we've made it work by having people be separated. But I think you know from your own experience, if, um, you know, I have an issue that I want to talk to you about, it's easier to just walk right over and say, hey, uh, Lori, what do you think about this idea or that idea? Or, um, it just, I think, creates more opportunity to be more efficient. For Mike, everything looks kind of claustrophobic and just sort of, Let's make it work without much thought to well, you're, each workflow. Each department is given a, a finite amount of space, yeah. and you've done a wonderful job with it, but it could be better. It could be a lot better. You have all those columns to work around, too. And I, I is think that what each of those blocks mm -hmm. represents, yeah. the columns? Oh. Mm -hmm. It kind of serves to show, though, what the quarter was like in the past, too, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, to a certain degree. It kind of yeah. illustrates that. 
and that little that like light lavender is the new corridor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. look at the difference in space that that was wasted, you know, by the corridor. Not to mention, as as Mark said earlier, this whole part of this floor where we have all the mechanical stuff inside the building, where most modern buildings now, they're all outside, you know. Crawl space. And those bathroom locations, those are original, aren't they, John, to the mm -hmm. building? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. His boys are one side, they girls are the other back there. They have relics yeah. of the 60s. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm going back to the day the building was built. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, they were, I think they were modernized probably about 10 years before but, they were. But the location. Location of, is where they changed. were. In, oh, that was, yeah, it's, that's a good old-fashioned high school, keep the boys mm -hmm. on one side and the girls on the other. And it wasn't even Catholic. Nothing bad will happen. Yeah. <laughs> and it was also very common to have bathrooms put on half levels of stairwells. And for a high school at that time, that was, yeah, understandable. But and those stairwells, that core of the stairwells is huge. And it's massive square feet. If you've got at busy time five, ten people in that corridor, even at the start of the day, that's a lot. And we've got capacity for hundreds. We do. It's just wasteful. And, you know, I don't want to steal the thunder of the presenters either, but, you know, when we were talking about ADA earlier in bathrooms, um, you know, you can just imagine um, what it would be like if you need to go to the bathroom and you can't get there and you have, a, you know, a, a wheelchair or some other device. And uh, even though we're grandfathered, it's still not not good. It still doesn't help that person that needs to get to the bathroom on the half floor, you know, we're, we're technically grandfathered, but it's just not a, it goes back to this theme of, it's just not a real efficient setup. Right now, made you're it work. on the fourth floor and you can't get, well, no, there is one on the fourth floor. There's right? one. If one. you're on the first floor, you have to go to the fourth floor. If you, yeah. any, any. No, the first floor has restrooms. They do, but they're, they're so small that you can't use a wheelchair. If you had a wheelchair or a device, it'd be really hard to get in there and navigate. Gotcha. The only, Accessible bathroom is There's the one at the end of the hallway. There. Fourth floor. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. changing point. stations. So oh, anyway, sorry to still. No, not at all. No, I, this is this is good dialogue. So get um, into the, you know, I, I was touching on option two. So we went to the bullet points. Like that was a great point by Brian to look at them. So again, now that was option two, we're, we're stepping down a little bit. And we're saying to this option is going to hit less of the goals, but it's still an option. Okay. But it does require some relocation of some departments if we want to make it work. And that, you know, that's not in my hands, but, you know, IT, that was one of the ones we tossed around. Because, you know, I, obviously IT, we could, it's an easy one to you think about that they can go into another building. And the unspoken adjacency, that's not, the adjacency yes. of IT to the police department is pretty high. So, But at the same time, did we even talk to the police department to make sure that they would not need additional space? We've talked to them about this. And I, I, and believe, that that, I believe the police department is next on your list for space needs analysis. Right? Yeah. So I would not be really interested in moving into their space because, again, we just did a staff this meeting. Is the, this is some of the old area, not any other new area. This is the SB1 where you were housed for yeah and keep in mm. mind you know it's going to be possessions is nine tenths of the law if they get IT over there they're just going to gobble them up <laughs> <laughs> they do already it, it, okay that, that <coughs> yeah, tends to happen right. but you know let's move on so again what you're going to see is the similarities is that the adjacencies are still staying there from floor to floor and we are doing a core where we're keeping the restrooms and and stairwells together to decrease circulation to give it back to departmental use so that's the big caveat between options one and two is add, give, add, doing a full gut and add, and this one is moving an apartment out to make space. And this one conceptually, if you go to the second uh, slide, the third and fourth, it slides Oshkosh Media up, mm -hmm. which frees you up, so it gives you some public space on the first floor, like a meeting room, which is, is completely lacking there. Uh, and then you have the council chambers gets relocated and media services takes the what's now the lunchroom and and i and part of it and with systems upgrades to mechanicals which is one of our goals we are decreasing the footprint on the fourth floor of the mechanical space but not but it's not, not leaving altogether and and also what you're seeing there um is 
council chamber stays generally in the same place that it is right now. Um, and because of the space deficiency in the building, you lose out by not having a dedicated space for mayor and council. Um, it, it becomes more of a shared space between executive session room and mayor council office areas. Whereas in option one, even though it was a big purple rectangle, executive session and those other spaces are in that addition as well. So as the plan moved forward, you'd, you'd start to populate that big rectangle with smaller rectangles and start to fill the space out. Okay, let's go to option three. Option three is the least invasive. Option three is again, the same basic elements we need to work on, which we believe the minute you touch this building, you're gonna have to touch the code and ADA issues. So again, this is why we're moving the stairs and restrooms inboard to decrease circulation and attribute it back to departments. This one is essentially um, what I would say the least um, effective at hitting our goals. Um, we're, the, we're obviously addressing ADA, we're addressing um, maybe some wayfinding, increasing circul or decreasing circulation, but for the most part the building stays as is, departments stay as is. This might be revitalizing and, or purchasing of some systems furniture to get to make use of the space you have. So. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if we're looking at our goals, and we, you know, we can go back to that slide after, because I think it's after this again. Option one hit all of those goals. Option three is going to hit, hit the least amount of our goals for this. And I think the important, one of the important components of this matrix too is the, the future space needs. If you talk about you know, how these options are going to serve us over time, so that, important to recognize that too. So, you know, we're talking about these three options. There's really five. Uh, one of the options yeah, was nice totally one. new building, mm -hmm. but with that comes the cost of a totally new building, mm -hmm. where it goes, what it looks like, what kind of materials, etc. cetera. Um, so academically speaking, um, you know, that becomes sort of a budget issue, but that's of course always an option. The other option is to do nothing, but of course then you're stuck with a building that you really can't do much with. So there, there, we say there's three options because those are the options that uh, allow you to move forward with your goal setting. Plus which, this became a school again, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well right. even though, but yeah. then you, the no. EA yeah. and... <laughs> yeah, that's... So you have to be completely retrofitted. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah. so the yeah. school's got needs. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the big segue is that really what the options allow you to have a discussion about is, is the budget. So, uh, as Paul alluded to, uh, option one hits all your needs, uh, hits all the goals of that, that were identified in the study. Two and three, you can see hit some of them, but not all of them. And so each of those options comes with a price tag. Um, and just an overview of how we put a bu budget together, there's the hard construction costs. Uh, we always add in a contingency because they're, no matter whether it's a new building or uh, renovation, you're going to run into some un unforeseen conditions. Um, then you get into soft construction costs, and those include all your fees, your furniture, your equipment, um, equipment including a lot of the IT needs, um, and that was another uh, thing that was identified was uh, lacking of technology in this building. Um, they've made do with what you can retrofit in here, but Ideally, with a gut renovation, you would um, end up with a 21st century uh, building with 21st century technology. Um, so you put all those costs together, and you, you end up with a total, the total project budget. And phasing and relocation, that's, that was factored yeah, in there as that, well. Yes. That, what does a temporary relocation of staff look like in, in order to phase, like yeah. construction, so, like trailers in the parking lot? Well. It would be a matter of identifying a space, whether it's a, a vacant office building or something like that, that could temporarily house okay. certain departments. You mentioned Oshkosh Corp having all them empty buildings. The, the, the library did it. So there's a cost yeah. to that, mm -hmm. and, and we can, include yeah. that the cost library. in but the that budget. In, that's included library. here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's actually a really good example, not only from that perspective, but also when you look at the addition that was done and some of the work that was done there, it was done in a sensitive way to the look of the building and, and 
and uh, so it's a kind of an, a good illustration. Let me want one quick question. I'll kind of put you on the spot. If we said let's build a new building, mm -hmm. same square footage, not one floor, but one floor buildings are kind of ugly going up. What would we be looking at? The same square footage or the square footage that you need this, 30 years from now? The square footage we need for the future, exclude land. So in looking at option one, option one, we give you, we, we give you a range for each of the options um, because we're, we're good, but we're not that good. You know, there's, <laughs> you, you, you budget close, for, the, you budget for that high number and anticipate that it's going to fall somewhere in that range, at least at this very conceptual level. But we do that in our street projects. So, it's like building a house. Um, option one at the high end is roughly $13 million. Uh, at the low end is about 10.2. And our figures, if you wanted to do that new building, um, you'd be adding 4 to $5 million to each of those numbers. Plus land. Plus land. Yes. Plus, plus land, right. And that's, and that's assuming that... <clears throat> Um, you want to construct the building and have it look similar to this with this very civic uh, limestone facade as opposed to, yes, you can do a building a lot cheaper, but then you end up with a prefab metal building. So pl like plus Plasticville. La well, land acquisition, utility work, parking lot. Disturbing a greenfield site. Don't we own a lot of land? Industrial parks, a good place for us. What about down the Sawdust District? Don't we own a parcel, a chunk down there? Yeah, we own a building. Two we, buildings. We got Three some. buildings, I think. Yeah. But we so also, the, then we, the other part yeah, of it goes, like public works, then you leave this as a blank space. Well, and yeah, so the negative to that is um, your current location here, you're pretty much downtown on this uh governmental campus you've got your public safety building right there um, the other component that we took into account we're reusing a building that's already here there's it's yep. very sustainable to be able to reuse a building as opposed very to green yeah pulling in Absolutely. new materials disturbing like Paul said disturbing a greenfield site to build something that you could have just reused what you already have we also felt that you know I think folks recognize this as the the campus with public safety and, 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 and City Hall. So there's some value to that uh, in terms of how you brand yourself, uh, irregardless of the, uh, value to the building the, itself. Valuable to the citizens because of wayfinding here, but it's also valuable to the departments because they're so close to each other. So these, these thoughts came out of conversations with staff and, mm -hmm. and, and council persons. But, and, and so it's not, it's not just our, our sort of our bias, but, but certainly we are keen on sustainability and, and certainly feel that this building has, has merit as a, a, a part of the history of. One of the things I appreciate about the work that uh, uh, Brian and Paul and Andrew did was, you know, an architect can always come in and suggest a, a brand new building and that's gonna be a bigger cost and a bigger, a bigger architectural fee. Sure. They didn't do that. And I, and, I, and I have a great deal of respect but for, for also, their approach with that. Also, though, I, I think we, you know, again, I'm going to, I love this options. Um, play a little devil's advocate a little bit, but I remember Chief Smith wanting to have fencing for our squad cars. He would love to eventually have garages so his officers are safe and secure, loading their cars and, getting out into the streets and things because I remember working out of that building where you would come out of your squad car in or out of the office and you'd have people standing there talking to you. There's no safety and security of that. So are they going to need future space to maybe 30 years from now where we would really need those options taking that away from them? All I'm saying is I'm not saying we got to look at building a whole new building, but we, we really, if it's a campus, and we're saying we want it to make 30-year usage, we got to keep the police department's options in mind, too. And you can, you can absolutely, you know, with, what I'm saying. With, yeah, with what you have now, it, the police department um, portion of your parking lot could be very easily segregated from the rest of the public. Right. Um, and they, they talked about that. There was a, they, they were looking initially at a fenced in mm -hmm. area with ga <clears throat> gates in and out well, for the, we actually looked at when we were right skating the side ourselves right. yeah. so i'm thinking you know i know you're looking at i think you're looking at going towards parking lot with that three thousand foot 
but is there room to go forward on both ends of the building? Is there a yes? I think we were thinking today with modernization of everybody using a parking lot and cars and no one's really coming entering from the front side. Correct. That's why I'm saying would the clearly, building be better yes. to build that side of it Certainly than the could. parking lot and not disturb the parking lot? Because we already don't have Does enough it work parking. The same? Not necessarily, but it probably, can. right? Do we really have enough parking for I mean when when the average citizen comes here during the day do we have adequate parking for them to do their business? Yeah, generally we do, especially since the courts have moved out. That probably gave us the best uh, opportunity. There are times when the parking lot's quite full, though. Yeah. Usually it's when we have something going on here because this is the only real open space that we have. When there's right. when there's a leadership Oshkosh. Leadership Oshkosh is probably the the, the best example, but also um, uh, whenever we have training sessions. Uh, here at City Hall, uh, supervisors meeting and things like that. You know, all the supervisors come in from all over and they, well, they fill up the parking lot. So I, I'm thinking is future expansion there again. We probably would never want to build a parking ramp there. And we have the underground uh, swimming pool. So, and so I, all I'm saying well, is options of what side, is that north so side better than the south side? We're, we're talking 30 years in the future? Yeah. In I'm 30 just, years, are you going to own a car? Who knows? Right. <laughs> Nobody knows. So, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But, but I'm yeah. just That's, thinking space needs, you know. Sure. I mean, no, I don't know if it's more expensive to go. No, it's a point well taken. And it's, and obviously, this is just one portion right. of this. No, I mean, we're not in the architectural yeah. site yeah. per se. We're in a conceptual site. But I'm just thinking out loud more or less that um, no matter what plan we pick, it, it goes like the one we had earlier, we have to plan, and it's probably a five, six year out or longer project. But, you know, as we look, our, let's we All still have options. the budget for the police uh, facility analysis the adjacency for the police department to the rest of the city with the exception with probable exception of IT uh, is uh, the adjacencies aren't as necessary mm -hmm. uh, they can be an independent building and I think part of the analysis is taking a look at that there are some advantages and I think chief would say it's it's nice to be right next to City Hall mm -hmm. but it's not absolutely necessary similar to Sheriff's Department being away from the administration building, yeah, there'd be some uh, some uh, conveniences, but for the most part, them being on their own isn't uh, them being more strategic. No, what, for the what's county costing the county the money is the transportation of inmates from the, the where they locate the sheriff's office to the courthouse. They should have built the courtrooms with the sheriff's office. That's they waited until thirteenth yeah. hour. To Those do adjacencies. That. Yeah, oh, yeah. When you take a look Plus at adjacencies, huge mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. huge these dollars. guys would have caught that. <laughs> so, right. So anyways. Well, um, this building was converted back in the 60s. What was the employment back then? Because the city was about 40,000. We're, we not, we're not quite doubled. And since I've been on council almost 10 years, the employee, employee numbers have not I don't, I, I don't have that with me precisely, but I think you're right. I mean, and we talk about that, I think, when we look at the, when we do our, our budget sessions. It's right. one of the first things that we review. So yeah, I don't think I don't believe the staff has grown tremendously over that time period. I think Andy alluded to that when we talked about our space needs. No one was being in, in the next thirty years. The city is not going to double again. We may be no, and, eighty thousand, but is that going to? And Andy the did mention that, that he thought needs. he thought the um, departments were pretty modest in their requests, and I I think I don't think they're being overly modest. I think they're being honest about what they really need. Um, Meeting rooms were the biggest thing. That was clear in a way. Yeah. And, and given the number of boards and commissions we have, that's that's as important as ever. I guess my question, though, we talked about this at one point, or it was brought up, you know, for extra meeting space, the beach building is right next door, and there's a lot of meeting space there that goes, you know, free. Is there an opportunity for contracting for extra meeting space? Because it's literally I, right And if you don't mind, maybe I can like just respond to this throw. too. And I, I, that's a good point. But I think what I what I heard from the sessions that I sat in on from the staff was the idea that they wanted to deal with the citizenry immediately and try to accommodate, accommodate them immediately. And, and could, could it be done where we would go to another building to meet with them or schedule things? It could be done, but I don't think it could be done as in the welcoming manner that uh, these guys were talking and, and about. And maybe not necessarily <clears throat> with um, citizens, but 
you know, internal type meetings well, or boards and commissions or whatever. Yeah, so that's one component. The other component is interacting with the citizens. The third component is uh, internal departmental meetings. Right, uh, exactly. I mean, you think of them as, as an office space. If, if you have an office space, you're typically going to have a, a meeting space where you can break out and sit with your team in a, in a more private setting. Um, yes, you could do that in this other building that you're mentioning, but you think about the inefficiency in, in time there. The reality, as you look at the three options, I think what it, all, it always circles back to, we could do those types of incremental things, but we're dodging the, the real issue is we need to retrofit this building and we've been a, a avoiding it. It doesn't have sprinklers. And, and if we were building an office building today, we'd have sprinklers. There wouldn't even well, be a discussion. You know, would, I guess to, right. to address uh, ADA stuff like deputy that. mayors, when they built the sheriff's office, they built a community room that mm -hmm. can be used for any almost anything. You know, you can have meetings there. You could have you could have the uh, all, all the board and commissions can meet in the community room. You know, you could set up the media services could have their cameras set up. You know, it's, it'd be like a 404, but separately located. Maybe maybe it's part of that expansion part because it's not in the secured area of the building then. So that when the community comes in, they go to the community room. Well, that's when I kind of envision with that piece is that it's yeah. not just a council chamber. Right. You don't want dead space yeah. that gets used right. twice a month. That's right. You want it to be part of that community. It's, it's got life. Sure. If, you know, the sure. Boys I mean, on, on, on city it, council right. nights, it's where the city council meets. But they call, you know, they dedicated it after the officer was killed in line of duty. But it's the Richard Meyer community room. And <laughs> that's where they hold their press conferences. When they have press conferences, that's where they hold their, like, Crime Stoppers meets. They hold all their community meetings there so that they don't, the rest of the building is separated. And it's Keeps safe and secure for and the employees. Was, I think that was the functional vision I think that these guys had. So, yeah, there's probably square foot all over the city to say you could have meetings in. It doesn't, again, works. Efficiency. It's a Band-Aid. But the right. efficiency, oh. here's now, as you mentioned, we have police officers who worry about security. They just get out of their car and they're exposed. Now we're saying let's have our staff walk across a parking lot or even a distance. Well, sure. And well, now th that is a security issue for them. Yes, look at college and that's a good campuses. Point. They walk to other buildings all the time for but, meetings. But that's a good it's point. True. Let's just say they just true. had a heated true. conversation with a citizen at the end of the day. They're waiting for him. And the citizen's waiting for him to walk out the door because staff parking is right there. And I, I think I mean, maybe, all those things need to be, but I think option one addresses really what, when I thought of the goal, when we put the goal together for 5, 10, you know, 15, 20 and longer, we're going to spend the money. We should be planning, as the mayor said, 30 years out. Could you let's, guys let's put that matrix right. back And do it right. Again. Not put a Band-Aid, put more paint on the pig and say it's good to go because we won't be here in 10 years. It'll be somebody else's problem. Well, that's just pushing it down the road. We've dealt with those issues in the 10 years I've been on city council of pushing things down the road. And I think the options that they give us are, are, are you know, I was more leaning towards a, a whole new building because I just think that's all we need. But they feel, and they're the architects, that they can make this building do what we need it to do for the next 30 years, keeping us in here. And I think overall that makes the mayor happy because he loves the architectural design of the building. and functioning of it and the history of it and for all our other for the rest of us it's very located it's centrally some of us can walk to the council meeting some of us can you know and option option one gives you that brand new building. right it's and i think that's what one, one, inside one a historic quick, envelope if, if right. we said only fix the things that are wrong the ada just the things that's option we, three that's sprinkler. option three because we're minute, still there, talking millions of dollars yes yeah. because yeah. you touch this building the minute you do any kind of construction you have to touch the code compliance in the ada and that will be disruptive to. employees period yes that's correct so right gotta, if we're going to yeah. disrupt let's you do it you disrupt and be done with it i think you, do the, it only uh, once. you know all of you hit on um areas that um you know could be addressed but i think if you go back to the matrix um <laughs> The, what they looked at is how could we address all these things in the most efficient way? You know, what, how could we have meeting space? How could we maximize security? How could we do all these things? And so it wasn't just one element or another. It was how could we achieve all of them, and that's what option one does. Right, exactly. 
and looking at the budget for each of the options, you, you can see that option one achieves everything, options two and three don't necessarily get you there, but like the mayor said, it's still costing you millions of dollars. So that mm -hmm. There isn't that big a difference between the cost of option one and the cost of option three. And we said, let's start option one tomorrow. On Friday, not tomorrow. Sure. How, how much time are we looking at as far as disruption? Are we looking at a year? Is this a year project, six months? You're, you're probably looking at about a year of uh, planning and financing, and then another year to year and a half of disruption depending on how we phase it. So you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be disrupted for a, a full year and then the disruption would begin once you uh, break, once you break ground. I think another good point to also point out though is that this range of millions of dollars you're spending for each option 3 is not much less than option 1 and it's only getting you 5 years of growth. The other one's getting you 30 years of growth which is what I think the main oh, point yeah. that you, you want to look at here. Sure. I think anytime you 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 know, that's we looked at the central garage the same way. So I think anytime a municipality looks to to expand or to grow or remodel, you should be looking for the longest. What's going to be the longest? Because in the end, it's going to be the cheapest. If you spread that over thirty, you know, it's just like taking a mortgage out in your house. Do you want to pay thousand dollars a month? Do you want to pay three thousand dollars a month? Depends on how many years you take the loan out for. Your to get you there, and oh. and it, it does the same thing. So in the long run. We are serving the citizens better by taking probably option one so that this building does and meets for the next 30 years. Well, and, and I agree Different. with you that the reuse of the building is probably the most sustainable. However, what I don't like see in here is any reference to like in those plans and maybe this is like further down, you know, what are the options if we're going to redo at that scale to make this super energy efficient to help offset some of that long-term debt or costs that may be involved? So to the mayor's point, if we started tomorrow, those questions would, would probably be in answered that, in the next four time. to six months from now. Okay. But, it, but I mean, do you see a scenario in which you know that gets incorporated in absolutely the, yes yeah to make it not just sustainable like physically but yeah. fiscally yeah and, and when i we, first we, met brian he made a point of showing his lead certification so <laughs> <laughs> he's good at those windows <laughs> they're not they're not, not windows and mechanical they're systems not. alone i mean we can talk about doing a lead building but even ashray standards alone are forcing us to go those routes already yeah we just just this past year, uh, Wisconsin adopted the 2015 Building Code and Energy Code, and that is probably 50-fold more efficient than when you guys moved into this building. Right. What? Well, the windows alone will be a big <laughs> welcome. And lighting. As far as security. I mean, I mean this is an unsecure building. We've, we had somebody at the councilman last night that I think has been barred from this building. He just walked in and sat down. Oh, he was barred? Oh, oh yeah. He was right. barred. Squirrel. Um, but it's it's a wide open. It's a shooting gallery, especially the, the ladies downstairs that are collecting money. You're mad yes. about your parking ticket, your taxes. They're it's like going to a, you know, a counterable. So how, how much of this money is security for the, em, the employees? I don't know that Percentage. it's necessarily broken down it, in that way. But that's part um, of the plan. I mean, yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's part of the yeah. range too. It's yeah. and that's part of what we do as best Again. practice, um, just being that our focus tends to be civic and public safety, um, we build those types of details into everything that we do. Think about the schools are paying now for security. Well, I, I guess I just look at, yes. at their project goals. They have the code compliance, you see was talking about, the fiscal planning, building security. So I think it's meeting, you know, we all know that this building is not safe and secure in a sense and it's, it's outdated. It's not an situation to let uh, right. citizens walk all four floors of this right At night, I've got the front at, doors at on. At night. Well, and at the night. other thing, and without getting too far into the security issue, um, you know, those stairwells can't be locked. So they really have the opportunity to travel throughout the entire building if people are here during a council meeting to any of the floors. But even during the day. The elevators can be locked off for different floors, sure. but not the stairwells because of a fire. Uh, fire. fire. Yeah. Safety, so 
Right now, the structure of it is, there are a variety of reasons why the structure isn't set up the best way. It's not as efficiently as these guys took a look at it and tried to design it with all these thoughts in mind that would give us kind of the best bang for the buck idea. And as we move forward, uh, you know, when I was writing the budget message back in October, uh, we were in the heart of this, but, you know, we had a pretty good idea where we were moving towards. Moving towards the possibility of, of redoing a building that was going to be multi-million dollars. I didn't need the final report to know it was going to be in that level. <laughs> Similar with the, uh, with the parks building. Now, we actually put that a little bit on the back burner because of this study, uh, but the, I saw that coming, and that's where the whole favorable economic conditions, if we're going to do these things, and this one you'll have to, you'll have to, uh, answer more for these types of improvements because they will be viewed as more discretionary. Despite everything you see here that we need to comply with ADA, we need to be code compliant, it's going to, you heard it with the public works garage. And I'll tell you in the last couple of weeks I have never been more uh, certain that uh, we made the right decision with that public works garage. There was virtually no downtime with our equipment during those that cold snap. And there were plenty of uh, areas where uh, cities where hydraulics on their garbage trucks weren't working because they were sitting out in the cold all night. Our hydraulics were sitting in 45 degree temperature control. It wasn't 80 degrees, it was just 45 yeah. degrees. It doesn't take much. And you know, I, I chatted with Bob Salm, our, our uh, uh, sanitation uh, superintendent, and he said, our stuff just works because we take care of it now. Well, there's not the hydraulics sitting outside. There's not the and, and stuff exposed to 100 degree temperatures and 25 degrees. But so to this I day, it's, it's called it's to, it's it's jokingly referred to by some cynics, and I'll just say cynics as the garage mahal. But quite honestly, it's functional, and we wouldn't have been able to go through what we did the last two weeks. And that's not the only reason we did it. But it was a darn good reason we did it. So, well, to so sell I, that, you might end up having to move your office down back to the first floor. <laughs> but, um, I guess, I guess to, now you guys have to go back to, to wrap this in a sense. I guess this goes walking. to what where we finished the parks office complex to probably put our building needs in a one, two, three, four, five category in a sense, and then. The budget analysis to where we which ones you know need to be at the top that we can do in the next two to three years let's just say three to five and then move it forward so that there's options for future councils to weigh them differently if need be and and that's essentially forward. the debt management plan is going right. to be discussing that, has that. To be part of that. the yeah. policy yeah. issue for the council right. is going to be how do we address all these right massive needs but and there needs that need to be we'll done. Put ourselves in the position of not being able to deal with an unanticipated. Right. Well, you know, John, if you can come up with the you know, anticipated next X years, what could go haywire? I mean, even new homes have problems. I mean, new buildings have problems. So, but I, I, I just old. think we need to continue to move forward and keep looking at options and and that. Um, will the Sustainability Advisory Board get a chance to weigh in on this discussion and make any recommendations? When well, we at, get this, to at this point, there, no. there's like really no that, purpose to it, but should we move forward with something like this? This is where I think... Yeah, one of the things that we do that's really effective is just as we did this goal planning session for, for this study, <clears throat> we would redo a goal planning session again for the, the project. And then we do as a separate initiative <clears throat> a, a similar goal setting meeting for sustainability. And we, what we kind of would lay out and show examples of things that we've done, uh, some new technologies. We really want to get a sense of your uh, commitment and palatability of some of those concepts. And then ultimately come up with a budget that would work with what your goals are. Again, it's not, it's not what we would do because it's not our building. We want to make sure that it matches your goals and of course, the financial impact is one of the you know critical elements so we look at things from sort of a good better best perspective and present those ideas to you and the group so that you can make the most informed choice um, coupled with uh, the cost uh, cost cycling analysis you know life cycle costing um, 
and really uh, you know get the most bang for the buck out of out of those systems so um, we call that a, a sustainability goal setting meeting we ultimately come up with a, a matrix and and really gauge your uh, level of, of commitment to to that element so so we've done you know myself personally I've done five lead gold facilities uh, were you guys involved with the Fox crossing and and what they did with their no aid? no okay. no but if you have uh, if you brought uh, to those meetings some of the ideas that you may have seen there uh, we would certainly you know bring those to the table you know anything from you know when I say bang for the buck it's anything from things that don't necessarily cost a lot of money all the way up to geothermal photovoltaic right. I mean so snow melted mm -hmm. sidewalks yeah we've we've done we've we've done that quite a bit you know and, and uh, Mark here comes a commercial <laughs> 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 I, know, I, mean, I know I had to ask so, <laughs> so, Go ahead, Brian. Brian. so <laughs> you know Mark mentioned you know sort of that preparedness and that readiness yep. and certainly as a as a first responder um, that's critical for public works buildings that we do we've done over hundred and fifty police projects in <laughs> over 300 fire projects so when we the, the realm that we work in is 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 really uh, uh, geared toward um, what cities need but also that first responder element so we're very keen on how the building would work and we we are not we would not pitch a sustainable element because it's something that that you know we want to see on a building it really has to meet your goals mm -hmm. and that's really the big takeaway here is that this is this was a wonderful team effort everybody participated you know candidly forthrightly uh, fairly I think everybody uh, was you know was fiscally minded on the staff side and, uh, when, when these goals were developed I don't think there's anything here that's that's a you know outside of the the realm of, of uh, achievable so we're very, very proud of uh, the effort everybody put forth so I guess the final question is just then under building modernization um, on that uh, mm -hmm. project goal is that kind of where like any kind of energy uh, energy efficiencies would kind of be um, uh, well energy efficiencies weaved through a couple of them building systems is probably okay. the main one oh, okay um, you know and, and a lot of the uh, you know lead points etc are you know tailored toward uh, mechanical systems but that's not where it ends it does sure. yeah. trickle you know it does have an impact on the materials that we're sitting on the formaldehyde and the t lack of formaldehyde in the tables the the, pro the recyclability of the products we're standing on uh, the lighting the LED lighting you know all of those things uh, uh, are, are woven in through many of these points. It wasn't specifically part of the study that when you get in design development, then you are getting into the, into the uh, into the weeds on some of the details. How what's lead certification do you want? Uh, what uh, there's certain codes that already are going to get you yes. down your lead right, silver right. and at what price? At what price? Yeah, and then you know the other yeah. thing is that um, we we also want to make sure that it's going to work. When lead came out and everybody was so gung ho mm -hmm. on sustainability, some some products hit the market way too fast, and people were putting down some <clears throat> you know some great recycled flooring products that ultimately didn't stick and they failed. Well, you know over time that stuff comes out, and so when we talk about that matrix. These are time-tested products that we've used. Uh, we don't want anybody to be a guinea pig. That that doesn't <laughs> do anybody any good. Um, but that that would be you know again that would be woven through many of these uh, examples right down to the you know we talk about ADA compliance. Well, the fixtures you know the, the, the low flow fixtures in terms of water conservation. Now, sitting right next to the you know. <laughs> where we're at geographically might not be a concern but long term it, it's a concern okay so that's all right all right hey nice job uh, thank, thank you, you. about my steps down. and I guess <coughs> so, direction would be what we've talked about I, both of these will be coming back I think we just need some you know 30 to 45 days um, I, I'm not going to be at the, the next council meetings in March so Probably in April it'll be where do we want to go from here and I think mm -hmm. it's probably going to get weaved into uh, the debt financing but also I think you want to see what things are on the horizon for this building that if we if we don't make it if we don't make any decision or decide to option zero uh, what's it going to cost us because 
John Urban's going to be coming forward with CIP requests saying, here are your building needs for parks, for city hall, uh, museum, et cetera. So we'll be, we'll be sharing that with this you. This would go through long-range finance too, right? It, it wasn't specifically, well, the, the debt financing plan, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, that's, the, um, yeah, they're aware that, that that's going to be go through them before it, it goes to the council. Okay. All right. Appreciate your Thank patience. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I know you had a long day.